Today is Tuesday, November 24th. It's around 7, 12 p.m. Man, Nate2D2, you are quick. Good job. Shout out to the live chat. Today, Adam Coleman and I are going to be talking about the baddest white man who ever lived, John Brown. Street Apologies Live is an urban apologetic show, and we serve the underserved and look into the overlooked. Very excited about tonight. We'll live stream for about an hour and a half or so. And so with that, I say, let's go! I almost freestyle right there, man. All right. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. Seriously, I, I I got all kinds of new tricks I'm messing with. Welcome to Street Apologies Live, or should I say, welcome back, Adam Coleman of True ID Apologetics. How you doing tonight, man? Doing good, my brother. Doing real good, man. <laughs> That's what's up. I feel uh, like it was you got follow that with like Don DeMarco, you know the the <laughs> battle joint, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, uh -huh. But I'm doing good, brother. Doing good. How you feeling, man? Doing all right. Well, I always tell everyone you're the you're the apologist that I want to be when I grow up. So uh, tell people where to find your stuff. You know, True ID blogs, books, podcasts, videos. Oh, yeah. Tell them how to find it, bro. Oh yeah, no doubt, man. So I got the uh, the YouTube channel True ID Apologetics. It's T R U I D apologetics um then i've got uh, true id uh podcast.com true id apologetics.com it's my website we'll start dropping some new blogs coming up soon um i'm actually looking at relaunching the podcast in uh mm -hmm. 2021 man i'm mm -hmm. trying to revive that jank man so you'll be on the lookout for that and um like you mentioned with the books too bro yeah you know, my this, this writing game b you know so i, I contributed um you know two chapters to the uh urban apologetics book that's dropping uh in april 2021 it was edited by uh eric mason dr eric mason mm -hmm. so you know hey we in here bro we in here yeah man uh making me jealous and envious but i gotta hold back my my green eye you know <laughs> but uh, it's all right well, man I'm not, really no, I, I'm not really making no green so i mean you know no, ain't green, no need for that you know, know green <laughs> eye means when you're envious no, i know i know no, that's right yeah but uh all right man so uh i'm excited about tonight uh, Adam, I asked you to do this because you and I have a lot of I don't know, sort of like casual conversations about things in history that we both see relevant to apologetics. And a great example there is uh, yeah. abolitionism and related issues. Could you explain right. why you think this discussion is relevant to our, our, our apologetic field? You know what I mean? Why, some people might be like, oh, this is an interesting historical curiosity. But to us, it Mm -hmm. I think it relates to things. Could could you speak a little about man, why, why that is to you? You know, how does this relate? Oh yeah, I mean, um, and I don't know how much in depth we want to go, but I mean, I think that there are are different kinds of objections to Christianity, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, one of those kinds is what um, well, I've heard Alvin Plant. I'm sure other people have used this term as well, but um, this notion of there being de jure objections to Christianity, and those would be you know the kind of objections that don't necessarily aim at whether Christianity is true or not. But more so has to do with there being some supposed other um, attribute of Christianity that's negative, and on that basis, it should be rejected. And so, in the black community, is this notion that Christianity is supposedly um, just the enemy of the black community? I mean, like, it's like you know, as Dr. Henry Clark said, it's the handmaiden of white supremacy. Right. And so, when we can put forth evidence to show that that wasn't the case, you know, what I'm saying is that you know, of course, you have some professing Christians who did some really nasty things, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, you know, um, we can show some other guys uh, or some guys on the other side of the ball, i.e. abolitionists who did what they did on the basis of their Christian convictions. Then it really undermines that claim that Christianity is just flat out, uh, you know, anti-African, anti-black, you know, whatever. And so as an apologetic man, I think it's very powerful in our context where we can show that. And, and then to be honest, I mean, this is, it's not just black history. It's not just abolitionist history. This is Christian history. Yeah, that's right. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's so much um, that I, that I found and the things that we talk about 
um, that are really powerful in terms of a testament to the gospel that have been just kind of sanitized out of the, the historical record. Like people don't talk about it, you know, but there's some really powerful uh, stuff in uh, um, American history uh, from a Christian standpoint, particularly as it relates to abolitionism. So that's good. Oh, snap. That's a exactly transformer right. on the screen. All right. That's dope. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, that happens whenever somebody um, uh, donates to Streamlabs. So shout out to Misty nice. Richards for donating to Streamlabs right there. Appreciate that, Misty. And uh, yeah, Bumblebee pops up whenever somebody does that. I'm looking at the cool. live chat. Cool. We've got some fantastic people here. Um, one person I want to oh, yeah. definitely give a shout out to here is Ernest Cleo Grant II. He's oh, a, he's man, of course. Facebook. Now, let me tell you guys about, about Ernest real quick. If you're I got a story about Ernest too. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sure everybody. Yeah, knows. yeah, yeah. If you're ever at an apologetics conference and there's uh, multiple breakout sessions and you're debating on who to go to, if one of them is Ernest Cleo Grant, I don't care who the other speaker is, even if it's Adam Coleman. But if they, <laughs> if they, you know, no matter who, if they resurrected R.C. Sproul, whoever it is, go to Ernest's session because. Thanks. Because he, first of all, he's hilarious. Uh, and he is an incredibly clear communicator. And um, he just holds your attention the whole time. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a thing to say, uh, quite a thing to see. So Ernest is excellent. And if you guys want to know more about him, go on Christianity Today. He's got articles he's contributed there. Uh, he also has a blog. Now, you know, maybe one reason we don't hear from him as much as we wish we would out in the larger world is He's too busy, um, you know, fiending, uh, fighting off, finding off uh, uh, Denzians and fiends in Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying because it's a rough area, bro. So, I just pictured him like like uh, Bruce Leroy in the hood, just ah, you know, fighting I it out. Him, I picture him with his shirt off, an adult beverage in one hand and a gun in the other. That's how I picture him <laughs> inside the door with one gold chain because I've seen how he gets down. <laughs> That's how I picture. That's oh, how I picture. Yeah. But shout out to Ernest. And also, I see Miss yeah. Titus, too, is in the live chat. Everyone subscribe to her. Shout out, as, shout out. As well. Titus, too. All right. So, yeah, I mean, actually, I want you know, give, uh, uh, you know, to give a shout out. I always try to do Yeah, I can make it real quick. But um, with, um, when I was really first starting to get into urban apologetics, I was thinking about like writing a book or doing a podcast, doing a vlog, or whatever. I wasn't really sure which way to go. And Ernest Cleo Grant was the first guy I came across who was writing articles about like Christianity in Africa mm -hmm. and ancient Africa and so forth. So I reached out to him and um, I remember I was at my job, uh, called him. I feel like it was like mad early in the morning. I don't even know why we was talking that early in the morning. But, you know, we, I was just kind of asking him some questions like, hey, man, how should I go about this thing? And he was the one who first encouraged me to really do uh, a podcast and start building up the platform before I do a book. You know, and so that's what I end up doing. That's how the True ID podcast uh, really came about. And then I've kind of progressed to, to doing YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, uh, it was funny about it is it was a couple of years later that we was at, I think, the Frequency Conference. Mm -hmm. And I reminded him of that. I, I, I wasn't sure that he knew that. You know what I'm saying? But I reminded him of that. And so we just had a good uh, talk about that, man. So he's a great brother, man. Great that's brother. That's good. You know, it's funny. Uh, he's also one of the people who first really encouraged me. Uh, we ran into each other in Florida. And um, he was like, "Man, you gotta, you gotta do that book, man. I, I, I'll, I'll be the first person to to get it, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get it." And then I, I put out the book, and I saw him at Frequency, and he was the first person uh, to get it, and he get, he got more copies than anybody else. So he was a man of his word, and just a real great encouragement. <laughs> hey, Nate Two D Two says your uh, nickname is Adam. Real quick, Coleman. <laughs> is it real yeah. quick or is it right quick? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think it is real quick. Yeah, yeah. I think that was that was given to me by quick, uh, Qu Quentin. Yeah, because I'm always saying real quick, and I take like ten minutes to explain what I'm saying. But you know. well, <laughs> let's talk about abolitionism yeah. first. So we're talking about John yeah. Brown in the context, and and we are going to relate this to apologetics and in Christian faith, uh, especially sure. in areas we can. But what sure. is abolitionism, Adam, and uh, why do you think it deserves, in some way, to we should recognize the uh, the Christian aspect or Christian component? to it but what is it uh or i guess i don't know if you say what was it but abolitionism yeah well i think it's important to maybe talk about it in in two different phases if you will because early abolitionists um really had turned their attention to stopping the transatlantic slave trade you know it wasn't necessarily um i guess like you say they didn't set their sights on stopping slavery 
in total, but they kind of really you know, dealt with uh, stopping the, the slave trade, as in taking people from Africa, you know, purchasing them from, you know, um, uh, African nations or just yoking them up whichever way they came <laughs> and then transporting them to the, the so-called new world. And so initially, or kind of early on, that's the the bulk of what uh, abolitionism was focused on. And then, you know, obviously, after the transatlantic slave trade, in terms of the international trade uh, came to an end, then the focus really shifted toward just, you know, doing away with slavery, uh, period. So I think, it's, you know, when we talk about abolition, we can really break it up into those, those two uh, sections. And at every step of the game, you do have people who uh, were active in abolition on the basis of the Christian convictions. Right. So So Wilberforce in England uh, was described even during his day as an evangelical. Now, almost all those Mm -hmm. guys in the House of Commons and House of Lords, almost all of them were associated with the Church of England in some way. But the Mm -hmm. question is, what does that really mean? And and, uh, just like the Puritans were associated with the Church of England, but were considered radical reformers, uh, Wilberforce in some way was also considered radical in this sense, uh, you know, and that's why he was called an evangelical. And of course, he worked with with others. Uh, John Newton, you know, wrote Amazing oh, Grace. Oh, sure. Of course, mm-hmm. he was a former uh, slave ship captain. And of course, can't mm-hmm. leave out, uh, you know, folks like Equiano and his associates. Oh, there. Yeah. There's quite a, a good thing happen happening there in in London as far as that goes. And you know, London, uh, the UK was the head of the United States in eliminating uh, this stuff. So then you still have the United yeah. States. And um, it was quite quite the battle, you know. It always it always been a shameful compromise from the beginning of the country that happened mm-hmm. because of, of the South. And in the beginning of the United States, the South had the power because of the agrarian society aspect of the United right. States. And when it came to agriculture, uh, the South was obviously uh, better, you know, endowed than the North. But what happens is the North grows, and there's industrialization, and so the North has its own form of 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 production it's a different kind of thing and and this plays in partially to when you eventually get rolled around to the civil war because you have this this equalizing thing where the north is sort of gaining uh uh capital if you want to call it that kind of thing and right. then you also have where uh the balance is shifting in regards to how many free states and how many slave states there are going to be in the united states and mm-hmm, so this mm-hmm. is a real battle and uh All of this relates to, during this whole time, there was abolitionists, and a lot of them were standing on Christian convictions. Now, can we talk a little bit about, oh, go ahead. What, you got something? Well, I was going to just throw something in there, too, because I think you brought up something important, that today, you know, when people think about, like, racism, then they tend to think of it in emotional terms, like, you know, just kind of hating somebody, you know, who looks different to you or something like that. But I think it's really important that we not um, read that into all eras of history in which racism has been a problem. And the reason why I say that is, as you mentioned, really early on, going back to the colonial period into, you know, when America is formed, racism, race and racism was really more so of a political and worldview issue. And then, and this, this is where it begins to uh, become, I think of importance in terms of apologetics, because in so much as the question of identity and, you know, what is man, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a worldview issue. You know, and so going back to, you know, your early 1600s, you know, there's actually evidence here in my in my home state of Virginia that you got um, Africans and white folks working together, uh, fellowshipping together, marrying one another and living together, working alongside each other the whole nine, you know, early 1600s. And in the the back half, if you will, of the uh, 1600s, there's this gradual progression toward what we would now recognize as being like kind of a racial divide. And so America, in a, in a way, in terms of the colonial period, got off to a, I wouldn't say a great start, but a better start than many of us would would um, expect, if you will, kind of looking back at things. But that worldview issue, man, really progresses and then is layered on with these, you know, kind of pseudo biology of Carl Linnaeus and all that kind of stuff. And it just this fixed idea of Africans being less than just kind of becomes hard in this society, you know. But there's all these different dynamics that are important to talk about, and it's important because the Christian worldview, as this notion of the Imago Dei uh, is forwarded by abolitionists, it's not just going against this biological notion of race, but it's going against the ideological and political political um, implications of race 
that were had woven its way into uh, society. Yeah, it did get worse uh, yeah. as far as that goes, uh, because in the beginning you had it, some level of compared to what it would be later. My understanding is uh, mild, not not total equality, but uh, indentured servants, whether they were black or white, uh, they weren't permanent. But then you had situations where, for example, uh, some of these guys ran away and the sentence mm -hmm. for the black folks was lifetime servitude. The sentence for the white folks was uh, seven more years or something. I forget what it was. You know what I'm talking ah, about. Yeah, yeah. That's so, the case of John Punch, right? Yeah, exactly. John Punch, so that's famous, when you really start to see name. a shift. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. John Punch. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of things, like when you're going the wrong direction in your personal life, a lot of times you kind of try to scramble uh, for worldview things to to justify it. And uh, the United mm -hmm. States, there was sort of a battle for the soul of America in a sense. And as economic power was more and more tied to force conscripted cheap free labor technically not free but cheap labor basically uh mm -hmm. you find these justifications and it includes lots of christians because there was a lot of people that were christians and so you have oh, yeah. people that would be ministers leaders of churches even missionaries you know you want to sure. think the missionaries who are letting now this is different this is going to native americans but let's say you want to think the missionaries who are going to native americans like they have a heart they, they, so they were super racist. You read about, and so some real, <laughs> real problems. Just this, this right. uh, horrible thing all throughout. And people that were abolitionists were a, were a minority, and people that had a strong right. view about this were a minority. Now John Brown is sort of an alien creature all to himself. There's almost yeah, really yeah, yeah. nobody like him. I've, I've right. run into a couple people who sort of had similar attitudes and if you want to say who's closest like him you're going to end up talking about nat turner and and people like that you're not going to be talking Very about true. you know other white yeah. folks really is, is there is one guy i learned about in my studies at john brown who be sort of raided the south uh but i i don't know a whole lot about him interesting guy but but mm. he but uh this is a fascinating thing and it's really a shame because there should have Basically, it shouldn't have took such a long, pro a long process. It shouldn't have been like, you know, what it was. It's, but, but, right, right, but right. it is. And so now we're yeah. trying to figure out how that is. Because at the same time, we can say a lot of the abolitionists tied a Christian understanding into why they're abolitionists. But sadly, a lot of people who defended slavery, even the chattel slavery that was going on, they used uh, the Bible to, to defend it. And uh, Yeah, man. I mean, that's very true. And there's a, there's a great book, and I might have it. In here with me right now is, is by a guy named Mark Knoll. Uh, it talks about the Civil War as a theological crisis, mm -hmm. and he really kind of gets into that. It's just the theological underpinning of those you know ministers who were <clears throat> kind of putting a battery in the back of pro-slavery people, and then you have the other ministers who are you know combating against that, and so they're kind of behind the political uh, struggle here that that eventually led to the Civil War. There's there's a theological struggle. And mm -hmm. it's very unfortunate. I, I just did a talk um, for Ratio Christie. I would encourage people to check that out, Ratio Christie WMU. And um, the, the concept of the talk was just, you know, um, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of using that analogy to say, you know, how, you know, sometimes worldly ideologies creep into the church. And I was using the racism aspect as an example of that. Mm -hmm. And th that's really what you have, man. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, but I, quite frankly, even among abolitionists, it, it is. Uh, something we need to be clear about that abolitionism was a s distinct uh, movement from, if you can call it egalitarianism. Like, you know, just because somebody was against slavery, they weren't necessarily uh, believing in the, the notion that Africans were, were equal, you know, right. and those are two, two different concepts. So it, it's a lot of, you know, murky details, man, that, so that, that are really important to parse out. When you read about uh, William Lloyd Garrison, The Liberator, you know, which is an abolitionist paper, and when you read about people like that, Cassius Clay, for example, <laughs> a powerful abolitionist. Yeah, we talked yeah, about yeah. this, uh, you know, yeah, prior yeah. to this. When you read about them, um, you know, you there, it can be easy to lionize them because they're obviously so much better than basically most of America at that time. Right. You know, it, it, they're trying to stop slavery and and. And Garrison would do things like, you know, uh, burn the Constitution and, you know, wanted to start it oh, over. He was about it, yeah. Stuff like that. So he was, yet, right. when you look at uh, stuff he would say, it was clear that, that uh, now he wasn't as bad as like Cassius Clay, but uh, it was mm -hmm. obvious there was these, still an issue there in how they view people of African descent. And a lot of the abolitionists, right. so these are people who wanted slavery to stop everybody, 
would basically mm-hmm. kind of muse out loud, can the African really ever live side by side with the white man in any other capacity other than sort of a childlike capacity? And most of their conclusions was pretty much no. And so what they thought is, what do we do next? And a lot of them believed in a theory called colonization, which means establish a place in Africa where we can send uh, these enslaved persons who are now free back to to Africa. A lot oh, of them yeah. wanted yeah, yeah. to, that was a lot of their idea what they thought should be done. And uh, they would even say, look, you know, I want to improve their condition. Like Abraham Lincoln said this, I want to improve the condition mm-hmm. of them and, and this and that. But at the end of the day, you know, it seems pretty obvious that they're inferior and you'd see things like that. So uh, this is only the abolitionists. It, again, we're re Yeah, and that's very interesting. That's interesting because early on, and I'm going to say like, like, think about like Marcus Garvey, for example. You know, he was known for the Black Star Line, kind of going back to Africa or whatever. Now, mind you, he's coming along, you know, your early 20th century or whatever. Uh, but in the generation or two before him, it just would have been scandalous, you know, to suggest that Africans need to go back to Africa and just kind of be, you know, placed over there because the notion was that, look, we, you know, we swept, you know, we got blood here. We put in all this work. You know, there's no way in the world y'all just going to use this up and then send this back. You know, most and then coupled with this idea, not, like you said, it seems like it was a minority. Most Black Americans, generally throughout history, have not been interested in that idea. Uh, obviously, there's no, always a no, no, there's no. always a minority report of people. Sure, who, sure, who sure. Say, yeah, right, right. But you know, like it's interesting, like Liberia, which is you know was established mm-hmm. for that. Um, my understanding is, you know, it's maybe ten to fifteen percent of people who live there today who are descendants of of you know enslaved persons who went back. And uh, right. a lot of them, uh, if you read sort of the stories about this, it was um, it didn't it was very difficult for them. A lot of folks had better oh, success yeah. if they did something like maybe go to Canada. They had better success, or or even the UK, okay. than going back there. It seems like for what I've seen. And so that's I, a real thing. Fact, it was it was Henry Louis Gates. Um, I've heard him tell this story about um, I guess a group of folks that uh, went back to Liberia and. Um, I guess they threw their documents of, from America or something like that in, in the in the water when they got there or whatever. And then the story goes that you know, maybe a couple of weeks later, there was all these people down at the beach trying to find their, their documents from America wanting to go back or something like that. You know, and you kind right. of tell us that. So, which I think that's probably right. I mean, because, I mean, you got to figure if, if you have been taken from the coast, if you're like maybe a second or third generation enslaved person, I mean, like, I mean, you don't speak the language over there. You don't know the layout. I mean, what do you know about Africa at that point? You know, like to go back, your chances are probably not that good, you know, or even for somebody like a lot of Equiano. I mean, he was, you know, uh, reportedly born, you know, African born. You know what I mean? But he you don't see him later in life going back. Yeah, he, you know, he made pretty, a life for pretty himself young when he was kidnapped out of Ghana. I believe it was. Right. right. And, uh, you know, he never really went back, you know. Uh, here in the live chat, Spanish Inquisition says, you better not let hear John Brown hear you say that they were not equal. When John Brown um, said brothers and sisters, he meant it. And actually, so you're right. I think Spanish Inquisition is a Hebrew's lie. I don't really know. Uh, it, always interesting things to add there. And actually says, I agree with that idea. We should have been sent home. Uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, where are you writing so this? Uh, where where are you writing this from, I wonder? But <laughs> right, so right. The, the that that's true. So this is how John Brown was not just a strange American. He was a strange abolitionist. Shout out to Mr. Phil Fox. He Phil said, Big up Adam Coleman. Always balanced. Love you. And uh, everyone subscribe to Mr. Phil Fox. I'm going to be doing a show with him on the Seminole Hebrew Israelites this Sunday evening. Great book. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's going to be good. So John Brown was, uh, was uh, unique in that way, too. And so that's where I was going to kind of transition to... Uh, a book by a great Christian author. He's, he's an academic, it's very accessible. Louis A. DeCaro Jr. Um, from the fire, from the, I'm sorry, Fire from the Midst of You, A Religious mm. Life of John Brown, New York University Press. If you get one book on John Brown, I think I'll say uh, this is the one I'll, I'll recommend. And uh, I, I've got a bunch of things in here that I think are helpful to discuss that I've I set out before the show. And I almost kind of wanted to read some of them and then maybe get your reaction. So basically just start and then go through. So now we're going to yeah. sort of talk about John Brown specifically. And uh, what you're going to see here is how his Christian conviction ties directly in uh, to his form of abolitionism. And uh, and you're going to see a number of great things. Here's the first thing I want to read. This is from Frederick Douglass. 
All right. And Douglas had a, sh a falling out with Garrison. And part of the issue seemed to be that Garrison still really wanted control. And even in his anti-slavery society, I think there's only two black folks who ever had positions of kind of prominence or power. He, it was still kind of a white enterprise. And then, mm -hmm. so, you know, then um, Douglas starts his own paper and kind of did his own thing. But look, he, here's what he writes about John Brown in 1848. This is Frederick Douglass about John Brown. I love this quote right here. Check this out. I think you're going to like this. Though right. a white gentleman, he is in sympathy a black man. <laughs> this just starts out. Though a white gentleman, he is in sympathy a black man. And as, as deeply interested in our cause as though his own soul had been pierced with the iron of slavery. Mr. Brown said that for many years he had been standing by the great sea of American bondmen and anxiously watching for some true men to rise above its dark level. Mr. Brown is one of the most earnest and interesting men that I have ever met in a long time. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I mean, I, I want like you to understand how significant it is. I mean, because like Frederick Douglass, if you kind of read his biographies and, and, and kind of see his interaction with some others, He's not the kind of dude to just really speak, you know, kind of right. in these flattery. auditory, yeah. yeah, flattery. He's not that kind of guy, you know what I mean? He, he tended to be like kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, not curmudgeon -y, but just, he, he was one of those dudes where- <laughs> Give you an example. He may not have been a- He said he had, he had it firmly set in his mind that he was never going to take a picture in America where he was smiling. That's and pretty. It, it was because of the- <laughs> Freddie D. You, you see what I'm saying? It's because of the situation. <laughs> right, right. He's like, you'll never, yeah. I'm never taking a photograph where I'm smiling. You'll never see that. Right. And, and I think it was, it, it might've been the, I think it was the women's suffrage movement, like maybe later on uh, in his life, they kind of approached him to kind of fight for their cause. And he was just kind of like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm in these streets for black people. You know what I mean, I, mm -hmm. I just don't have time. It was, <laughs> he just, he wasn't that dude like that, man. I mean, he was focused on what he was focused on and he didn't miss words. So for him to speak this highly of uh, John Brown, I mean, I think that, uh, John Brown must have been that dude, man. He must have been real, by the way. Yeah, seriously. And, you know, w real quickly on Douglas, everyone should also understand <clears throat> Frederick Douglass, a Christian, spoke about his love for the Bible, yeah. spoke about his conversion experience, uh, spoke, uh, he, he led Bible studies, right? He understood the difference between the Christianity of Scripture and the Christianity of a lot of the land of the United States. Um, oh, yeah. Douglas was a was a churchman, you know what I mean. So, so everyone should understand Frederick Douglass is a Christian abolitionist as well, because not every black abolitionist was a was a Christian per se. I mean, obviously true, you might true. you might you you have a good amount, but you know, right, right, shouldn't right. Assume, but Douglas clearly had a. I'm gonna keep on doing that because I keep on going out of focus for some reason. That's now, cool. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I'm gonna say, and real briefly, is because uh, some people would try to challenge on that. Now, I mean, Douglas, it seems like he did struggle with the problem of evil and had, you know, things like that going on. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. There's an account of a, a woman named Adelie Ossing. Um, later on in um, his life, uh, she was a German uh, Jewish atheist. And she actually tried to get him to convert to atheism. And she she writes in her memoirs that he, he and her could have had a great relationship if it wasn't for the fact that he was such a strong Christian. Hmm. You know, yeah, this is how she assessed it, you know, and, and, he, and he kind of continues on. So we can talk good. more about that. But yeah, good. I want to talk a little bit about the early years of John Brown. Uh, a lot of the abolitionists, it was this process. Now, Lincoln, people go back and forth on my reading of Lincoln as of now is it was, he was never perfect in the way he expressed these things. He was better than a lot of Americans. Yeah. But it's, I, I do believe he was better by the end of the war than the beginning of the war, for what I've seen in statements. He still had issues sure, of... Sure, sure. Uh, so I don't want to mince words, but at least a soft white supremacy. And I'm not, I'm just doing that because I'm comparing it to, you know, the KKK and stuff. Hey, shout out to uh, BK Apologist in the what? live chat. Everyone subscribe to BK that brother. You're all right. Check this out. Uh, read this. I want to oh, read whoa, this. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, do that again. You're <laughs> oh, God. I'm just kidding. That's not really it. It's like this. It's like, hold on, hold on. Watch this. Watch it. I got you. No, 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 man. No, we you're good, bro. We good, <laughs> Uh, BK yeah, Bonds yeah. is never going to do that again. Now use a real yeah, bro. All right, so check this out. Uh, uh, this is great. Yeah. This dude said from the age of around twelve, he had become a most determined abolitionist. This yeah. is a quote, and he swore an eternal war with slavery. At so twelve. Wonder, uh, yeah, twelve. <laughs> That's his phrase: eternal war with slavery. And At twelve, was I was like playing contra and stuff. I wasn't like thinking about like starting an eternal war with anything. You know what I mean? And so uh, this is interesting. So 
uh, Brown wrote that during one of those herding expeditions for his father, the adolescent John was well received by a very gentlemanly landlord. The landlord made much of John's courage and skill, doting over him like a great pet. The same man, however, owned a slave, a Negro boy. And look, this John Brown is writing this. And he, look what, after he says a Negro boy, watch what he writes about a boy. And he's talking about a white man. This is what he writes in parentheses in this book. Uh, this is a quote from Brown. Who was fully, if not more, than his equal. <laughs> he's saying this about a, a boy to the man. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, he just had to put that in there. These are, again, these are quotes. The slave boy was subjected to blatant neglect, brutality, and the most cruel treatment. Rather than being parentally whipped with a limber persuader like young John, because, you, you know, uh, John could understand to an extent. He, he got spanked, you know what I'm saying? But look at this, and this is what really traumatized him. The black youth is battered and bruised by the master with an iron shovel and left to Jeez. anguish in the cold night. So when he witnessed that, when he saw that, that's what led him to say, I declare an eternal war with slavery. So from a wow. very young age, he already felt that. And so he had great uh, sympathy and empathy, and he really never let go of that. And that's a beautiful thing. Right, right, um, right. And in fact— And it kind of explains like how you know the, the fire behind what well, we'll talk about later on in terms of where he goes. I mean, mm -hmm. if that's your starting point, I mean, geez, that's, that's, that's pretty traumatic, man. That's and, deep. you know, his father actually— his father was an abolitionist and pretty uh, G as well. You know what I'm saying? He, his father was, like, proud of John Brown. And, yeah. Uh, that and, family tree was tough. Yeah, it was. And he raised him as a, <laughs> and he raised him as a Calvinist. But the whole mm. – John Brown's father, a stark Calvinist. I might get into a couple parts about that. I got some funny things about that. I mean, even this book, you know, for example, I just, like, like, uh, like uh, you just look even, even like, you know, some of the chapters, right? Uh, a good cause and a sovereign God mm. and a uh, citizen Brown's Calvinist community. You know, that's when he started his own church, you know, like the, he was, uh, he was firm that way. Uh, okay. So John Brown had a, had a idea his whole life to, to start a school for, uh, for black children that would be not an inferior school. Right. Which is mm. a big deal because first of all, a school for, you know what I'm saying? But second of all, that oh, would yeah, not be not inferior. It. But the problem was he could never find an adequate. I think back then they called it a taskmaster or headmaster. They could never find an adequate. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I don't want to use that. You don't want to taskmaster ever, was the Marvel character, <laughs> yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't he, think that's quite what you're going for. But yeah, go ahead. Or my mom when I was a kid, he never wanted to find. He yeah. could never find an adequate headmaster, and he also had this idea of he always had wanted to adopt uh, adopt uh, enslaved children who were free who had no parents. But he never got to do those things, but he did uh, all throughout his life, did a lot of little things. Like he would constantly was taking care of folks, and he had a stop uh, on the Underground Railroad as well. And and a very interesting guy. Now, check this out. I, I like this, this right here. He also had the same empathy for Native Americans. Mm. And so I, I, I love this little story here. Check this out. In the meantime, He's a unicorn, man. his zeal for underground railroad work continued, and he became one of the most adept and committed in his work. Each passing fugitive hardened his fortitude, walking testimonies to the brutality and villainy of slavery. One frigid winter night, a fugitive arrived at the Brown settlement after traveling for days in the dead of winter. The Browns never forgot how the man's feet were frozen so badly that he had lost his toes, and, quote, the front ends of his feet were just as smooth as his heels. Another mm. example of Brown's early ideas about the use of force involves an incident of white hostility toward Native Americans who crossed their lands to hunt and camp on a branch of French Creek east of Meadville. The Browns and Britons, uh, th these are the neighbors, and a few other neighbors did not mind when the natives, yet quite visible in this part of the country, stopped by their cabins in the winter to warm themselves or ask for food. And uh, this isn't in this book, but in another book I'm reading by David Reynolds, he learned a little bit of the language and would go out and talk to these folks. And uh, and he he even would like bring them uh, food when they were passing through, and uh, they trusted him so much. The chief uh, hired John Brown to survey their land because he had some skill as a surveyor. Because hmm. they had, were trying to hold on to their land, and they knew they could trust John Brown to survey their land fairly. So they even wow. he, he so he, it's funny he even wrote to his dad and said that's how we know about it because he he wrote about his his dad. Uh, he, his dad, he knew he'd be proud of him, basically. Yeah, Phil Fox says, the natives crossed whose land? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I caught the irony in that too as well. Now check oh, this out. This story gets better and better though. Listen. <laughs> But other whites resented their presence and sought an opportunity to drive them out. This frontier racism became unbridled one Sunday when a group of whites got together an armed band to go after the Indians. Get your gun and powder flask, they shouted to John Brown from the road. Thinking that he and his hired men would eagerly join them, they were shocked when he came out and said, this is John Brown to these guys, I will have nothing to do with so mean an act. I would sooner take my gun and help drive you out of the country. <laughs> he was about to like, about to. <laughs> that's, that's epic not, he doesn't just say no you know what I'm saying right, right. he's like I'd like he's to like, take my gun I'll drive you out of this land <laughs> right and you, I mean you, I mean, really picture though like the, the guys who he's saying it to I mean they're probably like, like what <laughs> well watch what happens you know. the whites were yeah. highly offended by Brown's remarks his, his son Jason <laughs> recalled okay. but quote father stood his ground and the result was that the expedition was abandoned oh wow Wow, that's deep. that's deep. Yeah, seriously. I mean, putting your life on the line, man. You got to respect it. Gotta and he respect constantly, it. John Brown was constantly quoting the Bible. And uh, one thing that was interesting, so there's a there's a movie uh, that we're going to talk about, as well as a TV series, uh, both that relate to John Brown. And in the one series on Showtime, he's he's constantly forgetting Bible verses and quoting things that are like the Bible, but they're not the Bible, but they make it obvious that he's into the Bible. So it's not exactly right. The real John Brown had a, had a fantastic memory for actually knowing the scriptures and the oh, show. Okay. They, he's always like, what's that one verse say? He's always asking them, but that the real John Brown knew scriptures. And I like this. His kids talked about how they raised him. Listen so they to made him like Kenneth say. Copeland on the show. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. I, I like this. This is a kids talking about John Brown as a father. As to concern yeah. for their underprivileged, John Brown would often repeat, Whoso mocketh the poor reproaches his maker, and he that is glad at calamity shall not go unpunished. And whoso stoppeth his ear at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. And those are both Bible verses. Mm. Of course, as John yeah. Brown taught his children to hate slavery, he often repeated the biblical command to, quote, Remember them that are in, bound, uh, that are in bonds as bound with them. And so, you know, he's these are all Bible verses he's quoted for. Yeah, that's deep, yeah. And his children remembered that. And that's why, if you look, uh, when he finally went to Harper's Ferry and did the raid, a number of the men who were with him were his his grown adult sons. You know, they were, wow. they were both of the men. Wow. And John Brown had trouble with other Christians because of what they considered his radical views. I want to read this, page 88 of this book. Listen to this. Some of you think about this. After Dante's death in 1832, Brown may have begun to have conflicts with the Meadville Bible Society over the issue of blacks and Christian fellowship. Richard Hinton, one of Brown's earliest biographers, wrote that it, quote, was at Meadville nearby that John Brown was practically refused church fellowship because he insisted on breaking sacramental bread with the fugitive and held the brother in bronze, the equal before God of him whose hue was lighter. Now, that's kind of fancy saying, like, he viewed black folks and white folks as equal, and he wanted to have runaway right, right. and he wanted to have communion with runaway slaves. Wow, wow, wow! Jo I mean, that's deep, though. I mean, because I, I mean, is. but think about they were they, like to com excommunicate somebody because you're going to have communion with with a uh, you know runaway slave or whatever. That's that's deep. I mean, it's got you. You see the stark contrast mm -hmm. between you know professing Christians who um, clearly got this you know we're on the wrong side of history, you know, and then a guy like John Brown who's coming straight from the scriptures. I mean, this is not a guy who's out here just, you know, uh, um, just random militant. He's fueled by the scriptures in terms of his yeah. convictions, man. That's that's deep. I mean, the next line deals with that exact thing, Adam. George Delamater remembered John Brown at this period as a, quote, Calvinist, anti-slavery and sentiment, and a Christian mm. of high tone, end quote. James Foreman, so mm -hmm. these are people that knew him, also recalled that yeah. John Brown, quote, looked upon slavery as a great sin against God and a menace to the morals of the country, end quote, and considered it as much his duty to help a black man as it was to catch a horse thief. And and here's what's wow. crazy about that. There is a story about John Brown where uh, there was a horse thief in the area, and uh, when the person was apprehended, and it, it, was a, it was a poor white guy, I guess, but when he was apprehended, they found out how destitute and poor he was, and so they gave him uh, basically a non-sentence. John Brown went, tracked the guy down, brought him back to the magistrates and said, you have to give an equal sentence to him. It doesn't matter if he's poor or not. And they gave him mm. the, a no, more normal sentence for this. But while the guy was in jail, John Brown took care of the guy's family. Wow. You see, so that's, wow. The, that's, yeah. that's the kind of guy he was. Yeah, yeah. And His when principles, you, read that, you know, but yeah. yeah. 
That's it's, it's an it's amazing, an amazing uh, character. It's all these little stories. It's not just Harper's yeah, Ferry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a whole life I, there. I mean, because you're seeing like a, a, I guess kind of convictions about justice parallel with compassion there. You know, integrity. That's that's mm-hmm. interesting. That's very interesting. I, I hadn't heard that. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. pretty epic. And so you know, he he had a problem because. Uh, the minister he was at there, Meadville Bible Society, it looks like he wouldn't let black folks into it. was a house church at that time. And uh, I like this quote. This is from page 89 of this book. Thus began a problem he would face for the rest of his life. On one hand, his radical anti-slavery views were unacceptable to conservative Calvinists, while on the other, his evangelical convictions made him religiously incompatible with liberal Protestants and other unorthodox abolitionists. Caught between evangelical racism and theological liberalism, John Brand ran out of churches to join. It was perhaps in early 1833 that he began to formulate the Articles of Faith for his own congregational church in Richmond Township. They were undoubtedly Trinitarian, Reformed, and Evangelical in content. So we know what he believed, because we see his Articles of Faith he wrote for this fellowship he started. But isn't that a fascinating thing, but also a tragic thing? I mean, it was kind of weird. I mean, it is tragic, but it's... I mean, to be honest, I mean, and you and I, we talk about this all the time, is that I feel like I can, I can relate to that. You it know what I'm saying? Like because it's, I feel it's, like... It's like the same thing today, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, basically. I mean, to be honest, that's where I was going. I mean, you know, I feel sometimes out of place, you know, because on the one hand, you know, I, I don't fit into certain pockets of the church that, you know, that, that don't care about justice and things like that. And then at the same time, I'm not the guy who's going to be, you know, uh, getting a CRT tattoo on my neck or something like that. I mean, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, so, <laughs> mm-hmm. We got this in between, man, and so, man, that's kind of deep. I, I, that really resonates with me, though. I, I get that. I get that. And check this out. Um, there's a scene in this trailer I'm gonna play, where mm-hmm. they've got John Brown taking the Lord's name in vain. The real John Brown would have never done that. And I'm gonna talk about mm-hmm. a few things about w- what I just read, and also with that. Uh, one is uh, when he formulated a revised constitution for this what he thought was going to be a temporary multicultural community that was going to live in the mountains after the raid, this provisional constitution had in it no swearing. <laughs> you were going to oh, live there. Okay. You were wow, not wow, allowed wow. to curse. So, wow, like, wow. The, the, him cursing is ridiculous. And then also, um, uh, one other thing is, as far as the churches to join, it said that when he was going away to be hung. Uh, spoiler alert, John Brown gets hung. He's going away to get hung. Uh, they're like, do you want a Protestant minister? And I told you this already. Do you want a Protestant yeah. minister? You know, kind of last right type of thing. He's like, no, because you can't find a Protestant minister in these whole parts who's not a racist, slave, pro-slavery guy. And, and now I'm paraphrasing, That's but he hardcore. literally said this. He said it in a John Brown way. And then he said, if you want to bring me someone, bring me the most poor, <laughs> destitute, orphan black child you can find. And I'll, I'll and he can hold my hand as I go up. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> SD. <laughs> now, that dude didn't of, care, bro. Yeah, he didn't care. He's right? on his way to he die care. and he's saying this stuff. Right, right. He's still talking about Because back. of That's that, so. legend developed that there was a black woman as he was being help, brought to the gallows who brought her child to him and he kissed the baby. And there's paintings that show this. That is a legend because they were worried abolitionists were going to come free John Brown. So the only people there basically were soldiers. They had a bunch of mm. troops there. And here's what's crazy. One person wanted to see it so bad, he borrowed a soldier's uniform to watch it. Do you know who that person was? Wow. John Wilkes no. Booth. John Wilkes Seriously? Booth. So he hated John Brown, but you know what John Wilkes wow. Booth was? He was envious of John's John Brown's use of violence to achieve an objective. He was envious of him and wanted to see how he could do it for the South. So John Wilkes Booth Wow, and it. he did. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously. Yeah. It's a fascinating That's thing, deep. right? Uh, now, I'm going to read this about him cursing. Both Delamater and Foreman remembered him as a thoroughgoing Calvinist, the latter writing that, quote, Brown was always a strong predestinarian and firm believer in foreordination, end quote. Delamater said that he had, quote, great reverence for the deity, end quote, and was often, quote, shocked at the familiar and irreverent manner in which people use the name of God. In moments of anger and frustration, the worst he could shriek was, God bless the Duke of Argyle, which is a weird, like... <laughs> I, that's, 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 that's as dirty as John Brown's language got. Brown likely relied on the Westminster Confession and Catechism in the new church. So he started a church because he couldn't find a non-racist church. Its meetings being held right. either in his house, barn, or, or tannery. He enlisted ordained ministers to preach when possible, but often had to undertake preaching and teaching himself. Though he would allow no hmm. pro-slavery or racist preacher into the pulpit. Wow. But I like this too. This is funny. Wow. Neither would he have permitted a free will preaching Arminian to preside. <laughs> 
<laughs> Come on, man. It's like That's hilarious. Keeping Armenians on, on, the, on the level of, of and l- slaveholders. Listen to this story. That's hilarious, bro. James Foreman recalled an incident when Brown tangled with the somewhat pompous Methodist minister over the predestination issue. Apparently, the hmm. teacher got the best of him in their first discussion, and word spread quickly that, quote, Brown was used up on his favorite doctrine, end quote. No doubt his hmm. expansive pride was hurt, especially because the minister had outdone him by a quick tongue rather than a sound argument. Aching for a rematch, Brown put out the word that the Methodist, quote, was no gentleman, let alone a clergyman, <laughs> when, the, when the preacher returned to defend his reputation, Brown flared, quote, I said, sir, that it would take as many men like you to make a gentleman as it would make it was it would take wrens to make a cock turkey. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, that, I guess that's a diss. I guess it can't happen. You know, yeah. The Methodist it's minister had, back then, man. Yeah, had embarrassed the ins- the inspired paternal ruler. That was Brown's quote in the midst of his own Calvinist community. And now Brown was challenging him to a contest to reclaim his honor. At their next meeting, Brown was armed with twenty four questions that seemed to have been based on the Westminster Catechism. Brown's arsenal of Calvinist missiles were devastating and soon the flippant methodist minister fell silent one can imagine john brown firing off questions wearing the same determined expression he always showed in contests since childhood he did not seem to be angry but there was such force and mastery in what he did that everything gave way before him the mouthy preacher could no longer endure and so quote confused himself so much that he gave up the debate brown claimed victory for reformed theology in the scriptures but inwardly he probably felt the vindication of his role as a leading spirit in his settlement <laughs> <laughs> this is a character. He was, he went, that's a wild dude, man. So he, he he couldn't let nobody show him up, man. It's just like it's just like battle rap, dog. You can't let nobody get you, dog. You, you know you got to get back in there, man. They had like John, was, you know, eight mile be, because of this. John, they said that John Brown later in life, even though he never actually had that many men, there's the 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 um, the Southerners exaggerated how many men they thought he had. He usually had like about mm. twenty guys with him. He, no, no one really wait, was wait, down, wait. right? And like five or six well, of the I mean, guys were his his family, right? His son in law, right? yeah, son in law, stuff like that. He had twenty kids. Yeah, oh, that's crazy. Kids. And yeah. uh, you know, when they ended up dying, Listen. they said, "Bro, what's wrong with you, man? You got your kids killed." He's like, "America one day is going to be embarrassed about slavery, but they'll never be embarrassed of what my kids died for." That was Ooh, that's deep. Like he just got that's lines tough. upon that's lines. Tough. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's like a battle rapper, dog. Like he just had these one liners, dog. And he had exactly. uh, he had swagger, and it was partially the swagger that frightened. Uh, when I say Southerners, I'm actually talking about Missourians during the Kansas Missouri conflict. We'll get into that as far as bleeding mm-hmm. Kansas, but that's when he did that. And the famous one was where uh, this <laughs> a guy was given a, a, a speech. He was like a pro slavery guy, and John Brown went to hear it. And he said, "If John Brown was here right now, and I could see him, I'd shoot him right now and kill him dead on the spot." John Brown was there, walks up, takes two pistols out of his holster, lays them on the podium, and says, Here's your this is the best chance you're ever gonna have. Oh <laughs> the, and the guy just the guy he chickens out. I'm like, who is this person? This Sun's is life across the belly. Dude, this is John Brown was about that life, dog. This That's is crazy. really what this man did. Is so he had <laughs> right. swagger and he had a saying whenever they would say, Aren't you know, aren't you afraid you're gonna get caught? And he would always say, he had a certain way he phrased it, they said he would say, it's known, it's well known that I won't be taken. And what he was saying about it is, I'm going to go out fighting. That's what he was mm, saying. And so mm, and his you, point you. was, you're like, you're, they're going to die if they're going to come after me. Yeah, right. He'd always say, that, it's well <laughs> right, known right. that I won't be taken. John Brown against the world. I mean, yeah, I mean, at the same time, when you think about it, um, and this, this may sound crazy because we're still talking about America, but I mean, during his time, America was a much rougher place than I think, you Especially know, Especially Kansas, Missouri, bro. Yes. Right, right, right. I mean, it was like, I mean, when we think about the wild, wild west, I mean, honestly, even now in the movie, it's kind of glossed up, but I mean, it really was like that. It was really like crazy like that, you know? Mm-hmm. It was a rough, it was a rough time, man. And so, I mean, I mean, just look at, I was, you know, thinking about that movie Hamilton. I mean, we got cast through like founders of America who like literally shot people, you know what I mean? Or, or shot, with, you know, I mean, that, that's real rap. You know that's, and no that's one American thought, history. Really, no one really thought lesser of them for it. Andrew Jackson nah, also. Who, uh, hey, take take Andrew Jackson off the twenty dollar bill. Not not a fan of Andrew Jackson, but yeah, please, no, yeah. people in America didn't uh, think lesser of him for killing people in duels. It, nah. was, it was like part of, and so it's part of the culture, yeah. And that's exactly what it was. So let me explain a little bit, everybody. And I got another thing I want to read about John Brown in church. Mm. And Adam, I, I know you could chip in here. There, yeah. John Brown is is uh, an, an Ohio kind of New York guy. He moved around a lot, but a lot of the time he lived in in parts of New York. And especially Ohio. 
That's probably the main place he was. He's most famous for doing something in Virginia, which is now in West Virginia. But he spent a lot of his time where he kind of gained notoriety was during the Kansas, Missouri, what's called Bleeding Kansas. And what mm-hmm. happens is uh, they, the United States said, uh, we're going we're gonna to allow this thing called popular sovereignty, where people determine state by state um, whether they're going to have slaves or not in the state. And so sure. Missouri was the most northernmost slave state. And the question is, what's going to happen with Kansas? And so it became a battleground because the South could not let Kansas flip into a free state. And so mm-hmm. in the beginning, all these folks were coming from Kentucky and whatnot and into Missouri. And they would even vote in Kansas, even though they're from Missouri. They would they, they set these rules up where they would say, as long as you had a, a, a parcel of land. And they would literally draw a square in the dirt and be like, and they would come there that day from Kentucky, be like, hey, I claim this land, and they would allow them to go vote, and they could literally have showed up that day of the election. And Mm -hmm. they also would vote and then ride back to Missouri. They were not even in the Kansas Territory, right? So this this is not a state yet. Kansas had not achieved statehood yet. So the border there, on one side are pro-slaver towns who bring the slaves with them. On the other side are free, free soilers, free staters who don't have slavery, and what happens is it was clear the, the southern side was winning. So people in the east, what they did is they started these immigration aid societies. And they reached out because they couldn't find enough people who wanted to move there. They reached out to poor Europeans like German and Irish and said, hey, we're going to help mm-hmm. you come to America. You've got to go here, though. So they started mm-hmm. coming in there. And mm-hmm. they said, and you've got to be a free soiler, a free stater. But those mm-hmm. folks, a lot of them, a lot of them were racist in their own way. It's true they wanted... They were they were free. They didn't want the, the Kansas to be uh, have slavery, but they also wanted Kansas to be free of black people. That was part of the reason why they didn't want slavery. Oh, yeah. They didn't want any black people in Kansas. So John well, Brown I mean, but, is is an exception, yeah. even in that. Go ahead. But to your point, though, I mean, and and this is where I, kind of what I was saying to earlier or alluding to earlier. There's all these um, kind of mixtures of motivations and, and nuances that I think get glossed over mm-hmm. uh, when we um, cover history. Shout out to my man MJ Jackson. But I mean, just think about what you just described. You know, you got people who are, you know, uh, from from the South who if they've got their slaves with them, they're in Kansas. Right. I mean, clearly they want that to be a slave state because they they've got an investment here. I'm saying they want to take their free laborers, you know, however you want to look at it and, you know, build something for themselves that maybe they couldn't build, you know, in areas of the South where it was kind of already on lock, so to speak. Right. So there's these economic motivations on that Mm -hmm. end. But then you've also got these other folks. Um, who may not necessarily be pro-slavery, but they're not necessarily anti-slavery. It's like, fam, like, you're going to pay my way, you know, to give me a chance to start. I mean, all right, cool. I'm, I'm down. But they don't necessarily harbor like this conviction, you know, that the agencies that sent them had. Right. So now you got this mixture of folks where is all these different, you know, personal motivations and economics and all these kinds of things. And this really clutters the issue mm-hmm. of slavery, which is why, you know, later on, when the Civil War pops off, you get people say, oh, well, it's not about slavery. It's about this or it's about that. Well, I mean, yeah, there is this confluence of different issues, but it's still slavery is going to be somewhere in the mix. You know what I'm saying? And I think the Kansas-Missouri conflict shows it was really about slavery ultimately. Because if you Agreed. look, yeah. it's it's like the Civil War in, in microcosm. That's really what you right. have there. It's and, a precursor. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's a it's a fascinating time. This is this is. Uh, it was it was a tragic it was a tragedy what was happening there it was uh there was a group of people that got dubbed the border ruffians and they would mm-hmm. be on the Missouri side and they basically would come into the you know free state free soil towns and wreck shop on a regular basis and their view of the um mm-hmm. of the free soil or free staters is they were cowards and you know they weren't going to do anything back and uh there was some back and forth but John Brown thought differently. He's like, no, we need to we need to bring it back to them, and 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 so John Brown goes out to Kansas and Missouri, and he brings it back. So, no this is the most famous uh, incident besides the raid on Harper's Ferry, is where he's there and uh, he has some fascinating times. Like, there's this thing called the Battle of Blackjack, and uh, they keep on beating these outsized forces. You know, and they keep on beating these forces and they can't no one can catch John Brown. And it's like mm. this this crazy thing. And and it's he, he becomes like this legend. And uh here's what happens. It's like John, Robin Hood, I did think. John yeah, John <laughs> Brown, after some extreme um pro slavery side violence, 
John Brown says we're at war and we need to take uh, proper measures. So he had a Native American buddy. He had a, a native. Now in 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 the show, I'm going to show the trailer for. They show the Native American guy as the sharpshooter in the team. But my understanding in real life is the Native American brother didn't travel with them. He was a John Brown supporter. In fact, he had he was a man of means. He was a Native American who owned a lot of property, even hired mm. white people to work for him. He was a very unique man. But uh, he he okay. he didn't roll with him. He wasn't their sniper or anything. They show that, and it's it's you know it shows that he was down with a guy like that. But before they do this thing, yeah, that um, bridge, um, yeah, Pot- it's called Potawatomi Creek. It's very difficult to say, but I think it's called Potawatomi Creek. Before they go do the the Potawatomi Creek slaughter, uh, they 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 go to him to get provisions and sharpen their swords. And when I say sharpen the swords, I literally mm. mean broadswords that they had that they they sharpen at his house. Then they go, and they know where they're going to go. They're looking for Dutch Henry, who's a, a known uh, you know, pro-slaver, and they're looking for those who are affiliated with them. So they're looking for certain people. Mm. And they knock on their house in the, in the middle of the night. They bring them out. They take them down by the creek, and they hack them to death. And hey. it seems like John Brown didn't do any of himself. There's a number of other men who actually hold the broad swords. But he directs it, and when one man is probably already dead, he, John Brown does shoot the man on the top of the head, but he's probably already dead. Now, the press, the pro-slavery press, put it as they mutilated bodies and stuff, but uh, the evidence shows that this is simply when you're trying to hold off a, a, a sword attack. You know, you put your hand up, so that, that's yeah, why yeah, your yeah, fingers yeah. are getting Tied chopped off and things like that. Right. They're not. I mean, it's not a pretty picture, but they're dying in the process of, of having— and uh, now the question is, what about this? It ended up being like uh, five or six people. Now they did not kill the women; they did not take the women, and they t- and they they took them out of the creek, out of the sight of the women. It's often said they killed them in front of them, but my understanding of the evidence is they killed them uh, outside, and they took Away from the older sons. But one particular situation is uh, the lady begged, "Hey, uh, don't take my sixteen-year-old. He's not involved with this." And they let the sixteen-year-old son there. So they weren't just indiscriminately killing everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were after certain people, and they did a certain, and they viewed it as essentially this is part of war. So if what he did mm-hmm. was wrong there, it would be, I think, what you would describe as a war crime. Uh, maybe. Right. You see what I'm saying? But it, but but the, the question uh, is what what's fair yeah. in war and things like that. It's, it's a very complex issue. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. And even John Brown but, himself vacillated about his view, about his involvement with this throughout his life, this particular thing. But it definitely had the effect he wanted. They became afraid to death. They started abandoning some of these towns. Uh, everyone was worried about what you do. Some people sold their slaves because part of what John Brown did was go in and free slaves. He would go in the middle of the night and free slaves. and be like, hey, you're free now. And yeah. so people started selling their slaves. They were worried he was going to come in, sell their slaves, and kill them. So it had wow. a desired effect, and it became a legend to the point where the president put a bounty on his head. But go ahead. What were you going to say? Hey. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I was thinking, I mean, it, it, these these ask, um, these conversations do get complex because when you think mm-hmm. about, I mean, clearly he wasn't a pacifist, obviously. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, like where does the, the concept of just war come into play? You know, like when, when can you, I guess, invoke that and, and kind of justify your actions? I'm not sure if you get to really claim it on this one. I mean, you know, it, it seems kind of... Um, not quite vigilante-ish, but I mean, he, he was not like he was uh, leading like a sovereign nation either. So I mean, I, I mean, I can see how there would be like that grappling, you know, back and forth. Mm-hmm. But again, I mean, this kind of speaks to what I was saying. I mean, like, this is a different America. Like this, mm-hmm. I think when people look back in the time at, th- at this era of time, you have to you can't understand it through a ninth, uh, a twentieth century lens, if you will. You know what I'm saying like you have to look at it at their time. And like man, like this dude really felt like yo, they're, they're coming in committing acts of war against us, you know, we got to cut the head off the snake. I mean, that's, that was his perspective. You know what right. I mean? And the, and the idea so, was, so whenever these uh, Missourians, would, these border ruffians, as they were called, would slaughter the Kansas folks, there was never justice done. There's like one case. And sometimes we're just talking about wanton, you know, violence against these folks, uh, men, women, children, everything. And so it was like, we are at war. This, this, is, this is like, we've well, got yeah, to I mean, deal with this. And preservation of life, I mean, I, I think is a first order moral imperative. You I mean so if you if you genuinely believe that by taking this action, you're gonna preserve the lives of those, I guess these Kansian Kans I can't even pronounce that, these folks yeah. from Kansas, then I mean, you know, I, I could I could see that, you know, but and this is the same rub that people have with Nat Turner, right? I mean, you know, that, that, that's a whole different case, but you know, if you believe that you're preserving the lives of people who are literally being brutalized and, and killed and stuff, I mean, you know. Th- that's an interesting uh, scenario right there. 
Right. Uh, real quick, let me address uh, one thing in live chat. St. Dennis says, hey, what happened to your time off, bro? I figured some people might act that, ask that. Guys, this is the last week I'm live streaming on a regular basis. I had these shows set up in advance, and I mentioned I wanted to give you guys a little bit more before I shut down everything. And so uh, I've got a few more shows left uh, this week before I go into hibernation to try to write and I, I uh, wanted to do these before that happened. And so uh, my time off is, does not begin until one more week. It begins uh, December 1st or November, uh, whatever the last day, November 30th, whatever it is. You see, right? You're talking about like writing an album, man? You're going to come back with some bars, bro? Oh, you, no, you, no, what no. you going to do, man? <laughs> I, I, I need to hibernate so I can write 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 some books, man. And so That's I'm, good, man. That's I'm taking good. time off from live streaming. Uh, I got I to gotta go, and it, uh, otherwise it's never going to happen. So, yeah. yeah, this is a, a, a tragic time, you know, and John Brown is like a defender. And what's fascinating, though, is, you know, everybody's not um, everybody's not with him on this. And what I mean by that is um, a lot of these free soilers and free staters hated abolitionists almost as much as they hated the border ruffians. They hated mm. the abolitionists. And so uh, when they came in, you know, these ruffians would ask families when they came into the area, are you a free soiler? You know, and uh, when John Brown's family was coming in, Brown wasn't here this time, but his sons were. I said, "Are you free soiler? Are you free staters?" And uh, his son says, "Yes." And not only that, we're abolitionists. You know, like putting Man. them on notice right away. And right, so, right, right. so this is a, a real thing. And uh, uh, I think this is probably a good time to show the trailer. What do you think? Because I wanted to give a little bit of background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, what it is is right now on Showtime, everybody. Uh, there is a seven-part, I think, miniseries called Good Good Lord Bird, and it stars Ethan Hawke, and the same guy who played Douglas in Hamilton plays Douglas in, in this show as well. There's uh, some adult language. There's a couple of things I don't sign off on, but also there's nothing like it, and I give a shout-out to, to it. So let us play this trailer, and this is right now. Like This literally just came out like last month or whatever. So I do want to show this. I've been telling Adam Coleman to watch this. This is going to be three minutes, okay? So I'm going to play three minutes uh, here. Uh, I'm going to play this trailer, okay? And I want you guys to check this out. I think you will enjoy this. Okay, here we go. Let me let me see. Most folks never heard of John Brown. If they have, all they know is he was hung for being a traitor. Who is John Brown is a very good question. He is an abolitionist, often credited with starting the Civil War. But... It's complicated. What exactly is this new plan of yours? It will all become clear. He's most famous for a raid on Harper's Ferry, where he took over the nation's largest armory in hopes to and free the enslaved populace of the United States of America. He attacked Harper's Ferry with 19 people. That would be the equivalent of me attacking the Pentagon with 300 people. He was fighting against the world, essentially. He created this huge ripple. John Brown didn't just care about black folks. He cared about white folks. He cared about women like all of us. He wants human equality. Unlike all of us, he was willing to do something about it. Tell me, how many are in his army? Damn near 10, I guess. 10? That's not even a dozen. 10. He became a figure of mythic proportion, whose story was eventually covered up by those who wrote American history, in part because the subject of race was and continues to be something that we find very difficult to talk about. For a long time, people have been very scared to tell the story of John Brown. This story is so hard to tell that the only way to tell it, really, is to tell it with humor. If we can use history to laugh at ourselves, then that gives us an opening to dialogue with one another. Federal troops! are coming. They believe you to be an insane criminal. I am the sanest man you have ever seen. When you read his letters, even from jail, before he was hung, he's definitely sane. You may not like his sanity, but he is definitely a sane person, thinking clearly. And he knew what he was dying for. He was proud of himself. People would say to him, but you got your sons killed. And he'd say that someday this country will be ashamed of slavery, and they'll never be ashamed of my sons. Walk slow, aim low. Make every fire shook out! God damn it! John Brown was a well-meaning man who made many mistakes, but who should be regarded as a kind of maligned American hero. To have a really hard, honest look about John Brown, about what a lunatic he was, what a beauty he was, it lets you see that whole horrible time period with an air of humanity. I think this is going to be extraordinary television. 
And this is the kind of television that America needs to create. I won't live to see the change that's coming, but I hope that you do. All right, can you guys hear me? Because here's what I want to do. I actually want to go through this trailer with Adam and just look at a few parts. Adam, if, if uh, here, I want to put you on the screen because when I got the screen up, only one of us could be seen. Uh, is this your first time okay. seeing this, a reaction to the trailer, my friend? Yeah, yeah, it's my first time seeing the trailer, definitely, yeah. What do you think, man? What do you cool. think? Well, I mean, first of all, it, it captures you right off the bat, you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, they're right. When you think about John Brown, you think about like, this crazy dude who pretty much went on a suicide mission. But the idea of kind of looking behind that, it's like, oh, snap. Like, you know, I, quite frankly, I said, so I was talking to you about it. I didn't even realize that there was this much information on him, you know, that to even make something like this about him. So it's pretty fascinating, though, you know. Right. Now, I don't um, – this does – so the, 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 the book from the historian I'm reading, uh, he has a lot of videos on uh, John Brown, DeCaro. <clears throat> he doesn't like the series because it does partially portray – uh, John Brown as uh, unhinged. And the reality is everyone who talks about him says he was uh, incredibly calm and had basically nerves of steel. He, he, he wasn't losing. Mm -hmm. He became angry at slavery things, but it was what well, is not a psychotic rage. It was like a seething anger at the injustice, right? And so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they kind of portray him that way. You know, uh, they even have a scene where Douglas says lunatic. And that's unlikely that that kind of, you know, Douglas wasn't as radical, him, but in some ways Douglas oh, envied yeah. John Brown's courage is what he seemed to indicate later on, although he did have to distance himself from Brown. But let me break down this trailer real quick here. I'm just going to turn yeah, yeah. this down. So Ethan Hawke does cut a pretty good John Brown, in my opinion. I think, uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I think he, I think he it turned out looking pretty decent as far as that goes. I guess Ethan yeah, Hawke... Yeah. yeah, right? I think he did a good job. There's that. Douglas. So you recognize that's the same guy from Hamilton. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, now Douglas is my guy. So, I, you know, I feel some kind of way about him making make, making Douglas seem soft, but I mean, I'll let it slide. I mean, like, they kind of made him seem like he was uh, not about that life or whatever, but it's all good, though. They kind of did in the show. They made Douglas yeah. sort of like pampered and, you know, they, they like contrasted to Brown, who they made him have like – kind of no manners and being like crude and whereas Douglas is like refined and basically just thinks he's crazy all the time. But right, I don't right, think right, that right. was, the, I don't think they got, but the thing is, so they're trying to use humor. So it plays for funny value, but it's not yeah, historically yeah, no, no, no. correct. Although there's some true yeah. stuff there. For example, I'll, I'll show you some of the stuff that is truth in a little bit here. Yeah. And the reason, by the way, everyone that John Brown had taken to rocking a beard at this point is it was actually a disguise because John Brown uh, had to disguise himself at this point, And that's the beard. But you see a lot of the paintings that lionize him later on, uh, portray him sort of as a Moses type figure. This scene right here is towards the end of the of the film. This is when they're hiding out in the firehouse, where is where John Brown made his last stand there. Mm. And uh, you know, I don't know if it was quite that dramatic, but it definitely looks pretty epic. There's a Native American yeah, guy they portray with him who was based on a real person, but oh, he, yeah. he didn't really roll with him. And Brown did have a multicultural group now. Uh, I think it, uh, five or six of the dudes were black dudes, including Shields Green, who we might talk about. Uh, but yeah, that's James, Mc, which you're the one who told me about. That's James McBride. He's the author of of the book that it's based upon. Uh, and so, you know, they uh, he was involved with the production apparently in some way, I guess. And um, this is an interesting thing. They show John Brown have this connection with nature in this show a lot. And sometimes it comes off as crazy, like he's talking to rabbits. But through my research, what I've looked at is they're partially filtering their picture of Brown through the transcendentalists, Ill illiterati. So the transcendentalists was the school like Thoreau and Emerson who had this um, idea of like sort of contemplating nature for moral values and higher realities. And you're alone in the cabin in the woods and you transcend and that's how you can write poetry and overcome I mean, you know, I'm not getting exactly right, but the transcendentalist. That's right, yeah, like Walden Pond, I think is yes. like the famous one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So they 
they became Brown's biggest uh, supporters in writing. During his life, uh, slowly but surely, and then later on, especially after he died, they were very uh, instrumental. And he had this thing, Brown had this thing called the Secret Six, and I think three or four of them were all transcendentalists. Out of, out of that, I think only one of them uh, was a Christian. And that's what's interesting is a lot of John Brown's support was actually not really from Christian. His own sons turned agnostic later on in life. Some of them did. One of them became right. a uni- universalist. Yeah, one of his sons seemed to have, his daughters seemed more faithful as far as the Christian faith goes. But John yeah. Brown, he uh, he kind of was not judgmental in that way. It's weird because he was a stern man, but he was very sort of a Renaissance man, have an open discussion. But these things with nature and um, are kind of based upon the transcendentalist picture of John Brown because they viewed him as kind of being in line with that. How true is that? All that I don't really know. But uh, there's Harriet Tubman. Oh wait, no, that, no, that's not her. That's a different situation. I forget. So I, I they, they, that's not Harriet Tubman. But they, they oh, show okay. Harriet Tubman as a character. And guess what John Brown's nickname for Harriet Tubman was? This is his nickname for her, the General. Oh, really? And Harriet dope, Tubman tried to help John Brown get men for the raid on Harper's Ferry. So she was one of the few people yeah. he told his plans to because he didn't tell his plans to anybody. He told Douglas and he told her and he didn't. The funny thing about John Brown is he <laughs> he trusted more black folks than white folks with his plans. That's funny. And so, funny. Well, I mean, yeah, he probably figured they was down, you know what I mean? And maybe that's why he was so surprised by Douglas. Now, what's interesting is, is that... Um, it's a different actor, but in, in the um, Harry Tubman movie, they kind of portrayed Douglas the same way. It's like, you know, he, he's for the cause, but he's not willing to go but so far. You know what I mean? So I kind of, I think it's interesting that you have Harry Tubman and John Brown kind of, you know, both willing to you know, lay their life on the line. Just you know, kind of lay aside your know, regard for self and then you know, do what they felt needed to be done. So, I mean, yeah, I, I can, it makes sense that they would be down, you know, like that. John Brown said he had more respect for Harry Tubman than, than most men. So he, he really was a strong I mean, uh, he was a strong admirer of her, you know. Yeah. And um, you know, there's a scene in here where where Douglas is like, Oh, tell me about this new plan that you have. By the way, uh, we're not gonna get into it, but you notice they're portraying the ladies in Douglas's life, <laughs> Adam Coleman. <laughs> Oh yeah. no! I mean, no, I mean, I don't know if you want to go into that, but no, I mean, no, that's, no, no. that's not, not this, accurate. Yeah. Not this time. That's about right. <laughs> we'll do that another time. Yeah, that's about right. But but no, what's interesting <laughs> is that um, <laughs> I'm trying to stay on task here. But like with Harriet Tubman, I mean, she did have those sensibilities because later on, I guess in her abolition abolitionist career, when the Civil War comes around, she actually does you know play the role of a scout and, and participates in leading a raid mm-hmm. herself. You know, so. Yep. And her and John Brown, they, they was like that, man. They, they wasn't and she carried around. a pistol. And whenever yeah. whenever someone got I scared, heard. whenever yeah. someone got scared, she put that in their back and said, I'm going to shoot you dead. You're not going to go back. Because she didn't want them to go back and reveal the, the Underground Railroad Stitch. routes. So they, right. they they overcame their fear real quick because they had a greater fear of her and her gun. <laughs> They're going right. She wasn't playing. She was, she was a praying woman. But she also hit you with that lead, too, Doc. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, she wasn't playing, dog. Like John Brown, his favorite quote was an Oliver Cromwell quote, which is, trust in God and keep your powder dry. <laughs> trust in God and but keep, hey, keep right. your gunpowder dry. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Right. Now, this is very fascinating. I'm going to show, I'm gonna show uh, this right here. This is one of John Brown's hostages. And this is based, this is a real person. John Brown mm-hmm. knew who this guy was. This guy was supposedly a descendant of George Washington. And John Brown was a patriot, so he he based a lot of what he said on the Declaration. He just basically saw that they were hip, hypocritical in their application. So this is a descendant of Washington, and there's supposedly a sword in his house. This is all true, by the way, what I'm saying now. Th- this man they took hostage. That was given to Washington that he had. And so John Brown saw it as highly symbolic to capture this slave owner who was a descendant of Washington. And when he freed his slaves, guess who he had guard him? He had his slaves guard him. And one of the weapons he gave them was this sword that George Washington had. So he viewed it as a highly symbolic act in the way he was doing it. But, I mean, some of these, uh, you know, recently freed slaves were like, who is this crazy white man that just told me I'm free and then gave me a pike? Because he ordered a bunch of pikes, and when they shipped them, they disguised them as Beecher's Bibles. That's what they called them. Uh, but he, he had these pikes, and he would give him a pike and say, strike for freedom if anyone tries to come and, and bother you. <laughs> and, and most of these folks had no idea how to use a weapon. But John Brown figured that you can use, forget to use a pike, you know what I'm saying? And so he would give him a pike, say, uh, strike for freedom. And then 
when he had the uh, recently freed slaves guard the white folks, this is a quote. He literally said, don't let those white people out of the house. So he's seeking to, <laughs> this dude like identified on a level that it's hard to imagine. In fact, in one of his letters he wrote, he kept on saying we. He's talking about the black community. Mm. He kept on saying we. Mm. So the pronouns he used. But I thought it was so funny, John Brown, don't let those white men out of the house. Don't let those white men out of the house. <laughs> like, and I mean, and you got to figure too, because you talked about how you only had a few a few folks with him. But I mean, if you're an if you're an enslaved person, right? You're on on whatever plantation. And this white dude comes up like, yo, he gives you a weapon. Right. And he's telling you to defend yourself. I mean, you're not going to be inclined to trust that guy because, I mean, seclusion Mm -hmm. was the name of the game back then. I mean, like they didn't want slaves and slave persons intermingling with one another or pretty much really have any sort of life outside, you know, uh, that plantation world for the most part. So for John Brown to come through and give you a weapon, you know what I mean? And be like, yo, we, we about to ride on these cats. I mean, that that would just be like. It'd be like you know an alien invasion kind of thing. It'd just be like <laughs> it'd be hard to wrap your mind around. You you'd be you'd be hard pressed to to believe this guy and say, "Oh, are we really going to do this?" You know what I mean? No, that's so. exactly right, Adam. And that actually relates to part of the failure of Harper's Ferry's raid, because John Brown had this idea. He kept on saying the bees will swarm, and by the bees swarming, he meant when people heard about what he was doing, he thought a bunch of inspired folks were going to come join him in his rebellion, and he was going to have this massive army of this multicultural community in the, in the Allegheny Mountains there. But what happens is mm. they didn't come, and there's a few different reasons. And one of the reasons apparently is, and I'm going to go off this trailer uh, back into to, to our self here, one of the reasons apparently is they didn't believe it. When they were told a white mm. man was going to free slaves and was willing to die for them in battle, they, they thought there's no such thing as that kind of person. This is not true. They didn't think it was true. So no one is going to join someone because they think it's mythical. Then when he did free some of the folks, they thought it was a trick, and he was stealing them off one master, so-called, and was going to resell them somewhere else. That's what what they thought he was doing to them. It makes sense, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, so the thing is that uh, John Brown, uh, he thought this was going to inspire a whole thing. And then his goal was to, uh, I'm I'm talking about the raid on Harper's Ferry, he was going to go into the south and keep on raiding, raiding it there. And so, right, you know, that's right. the thing. Besides Pottawatomie Creek, that's the other main thing he's known for is the raid on Harper's Ferry, which the idea yeah, and, was... and when you think about it, I mean, that's why when, when they depict him as being crazy and, you know, in the trailer and whatnot, I mean, for his time, I mean, he was so far out of the norm mm-hmm. and so willing to just basically, you know, risk his life or just really lay his life on the line. I mean, you would think that no sane person would do that. You know, I mean, he's just like so far out of the uh, out of the box. So I get why people think this dude was crazy. And actually, I mean, that, that goes back to Frederick Douglass. I mean, he was like, because, I mean, you know, obviously John Brown tried to enlist uh, Frederick Douglass's help, you know, with the raid and all that kind of stuff. And I think Frederick was like, yo, you, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's suicide. I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but, I mean, it, you know, kind of makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, if at that time, I mean, it, it seemed like a suicide mission. You know? Yeah. And John Brown was okay with that, basically. So... Right, right, right. Uh, you know, with he was okay with that, that that he wanted to do something different. He wasn't trying to die. So people portray him as crazy, but he yeah. actually had a good a, a good idea in some ways. So what he did is he studied guerrilla warfare first of all, and then hmm. he studied Nat Turner's slave rebellion, and he studied the uprising in Haiti, and he believed hmm. that these uprisings were uh, an apologetic against black inferiority. He believed they were an apologetic, mm. especially the, uh, the Haiti one. And what he saw is that uh, what they did is the Maroons, you know, they were hiding out with natural barriers or fortresses. And so his idea was we raid Harper's Ferry, which is the largest uh, armory stockpile in the United States at the time. And uh, it was a federal thing. So John Brown was going to war with the federal government because he viewed them as complicit with slavery at that point because of things like the Fugitive Slave Act. And uh, the pro-slavery presidents prior to Lincoln and, and what they were saying about Kansas and Missouri. So mm-hmm. he – this wasn't a state thing. He went after a federal armory, right? And he took it, yeah. which is an amazing thing. And so what he did is the idea was we're going to take all these weapons. We're going to go into the mountains, and then we're going to arm all the black folks who are going to come to this and teach them how to use these. So he studied guerrilla warfare and, and these other rebellions. And before people think it's too crazy, think about Osama bin Laden. Obviously, superior forces, how long was he able to evade essentially the world by using natural 
um, formations of the earth, you know, mountains and caves and things like that to hide out, right? You see what I'm saying? That, so John Brown was going to try to do yeah. the same thing because it wasn't until about a month till they caught Nat Turner. It took him about a month. It took him a while. Yeah, so sure he did, saw yeah. that was a possibility. So the Allegheny Mountains were this natural defense barrier. And so he was going to have this it multicultural actually, society there that was also terrorists against slave owners. Right. Well, and I want to kind of add some depth to that, too, because, well, on two grounds, you, know, you mentioned how um, he viewed these these kind of counter state efforts, you know what I'm saying, by like Tucson Overture down in Haiti, for example, mm-hmm. as being apologetic against this notion of white supremacy, I think what's important to remember is that at this time, enlightenment thinking had really uh, infused society as well. And a part of that had to do with um, the mental capacities of people groups uh, mm-hmm. being, you know, basically kind of counted against Africans. You know what I'm saying? That they, they were supposedly of lower mental status mm-hmm. and thereby lesser beings. You know what I'm saying? That, that kind of really flows out of the enlightenment period. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the notion of, of these military groups having strategy. Uh, you know, mounting a unified, concerted effort, organizing with one another. All of those would have been seen as being indicative of like higher order mental activities. Mm -hmm. So for black people to do that, it was a demonstration that, wait a minute, you know, these cats aren't of lesser personhood. They actually do have these mental capacities that we said that they don't have. So for Tucson Liverpool particularly, I mean, this dude was fighting up against France. I mean, it was that was about as big a world power as you would have back then, Mm -hmm. right? So for them to fight against France and win, that was a huge demonstration that the narrative about black people was false. You know what I'm saying it's false that they can't organize. It's false that they can't, you know, strategize and have, and exercise self uh, governance and these mm-hmm. kinds of things. And so it makes a lot of sense then why John Brown would be looking into that sort of thing and saying and seeing indicators uh, that white supremacy was false and, and kind of bolstering that. But it, again, you know, I mean, you're right. I mean, as far as using these natural barriers. Um, for that time, I mean, that was, I mean, that, that's um, in, in some ways how the, the, the American forces defeated uh, the British you know, in the Revolutionary War. They did the same thing. You know, and that was in the complaint among the British was that, you know, Americans were fighting like cowards, you know, they rather than just kind of marching in regiments and just blasting each other on the field. Americans were kind of they, they actually drew from the Na- Native Americans, learned some lessons from them and employed mm-hmm. that against the British. And so you see. Uh, John Brown really doing the same thing. I mean, so, I mean, it was smart. It's something that it, at his time, he's coming along. I mean, you, he'd seen it work in war, mm-hmm. you know, in the Revolutionary War, Tucson Literature, and so forth. So it makes a lot of sense why he would try it himself. And he had this idea it's set for about 20 years. And he, um, he, it's interesting that he confided and sought advice mainly from black folks because a lot of the abolitionists. They, they saw themselves as champions of liberty and freedom, and, you know, to a certain extent, obviously it's true. I mean, they're not pro-slavery. But John Brown was different in that he lived in a multicultural community. The main area he lived in called Upper Elba was a black and white community. So, he, And he went out of his way to, if he, if he could hire folks, care for So he was like, you know, eating, living, working, everything he did, you know what I'm saying? And so when he would seek advice through his letters he would write, uh, through different communities, like he asked the Upper Elbans, like, um, what do you want me to do? He So he didn't see himself as like a white savior. He saw himself as sort of under them to see what is best for you. And he would ask them uh, what you want to do. It's very fascinating. David Reynolds, who wrote an incredible biography of Brown. That's The, the two books I recommend are, are this and David S. Reynolds' uh, biography of John Brown. He brings it out. He is like, even his inspiration was based on black culture in a certain sense you know that's the way the author puts it and whatnot it's a very fascinating thing so like I, i'm gonna throw some jabs right quick <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm th- I mean, let me throw a jab right quick you know what i mean okay. yeah. so you know when you think about john brown coming to the black community and saying hey you know how can i be of help if you will then mm-hmm. like rather than coming in you know uh trying to um take over and basically just be kind of like paternalistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite frankly, you know, when you look at uh, the liberal movement here in America, you know what I'm saying, like the leftists and so on and so forth, I mean, there are are times, and you know, Malcolm X spoke about this, you know, a a number of different people have, but sometimes you have people on on the left who think they know what's best for black people. You know what I mean? They want to, they want to impose sets of values and ideas, ideals, or ideas upon the black community that we don't really rock with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because they feel like, oh, it's just good for you. 
And so that can be just as harmful as whatever people believe about conservatives and being standoffish. You know, we've also seen through history, you have the liberal, you know, uh, quite frankly, you know, the white liberal who thinks they know what's best for black people better than black people do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And John Brown's not taking that position. He's not being standoffish and, you know, just kind of stand idly by. But at the same time, he's also not trying to impose his will on the situation. He's really trying to assess what's going on, get an understanding, kind of a self-determination kind of a thing for the black community, and then come in accord with that. And that's pretty insightful, particularly for that time, I would think. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And uh, it's very interesting when you see it, because you can see in his letters his deference and different things like that. And there's actually some interesting little stories. This is um, not exactly as far as, uh, you know, like, uh, check this out. Some other stuff that's interesting in relation to that is his egalitarian nature. Is mm -hmm. that when they uh, established who was going to be uh, kind of the head of the provisional government that they were going to have when they were living there? Uh, what what they did is they elected people, and the president and vice president that they elected both were black. Mm. So John Brown has this and uh, setting up this provisional temporary government they were going to have in the mountains. The president and the vice president are both black men. So it's like so the first president on American soil wasn't uh, Barack yeah. Obama. The first black president yeah. in America wasn't uh, Barack Obama. It was whoever <laughs> whoever that was. Uh, yeah, and 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 check this out. They also hit John Brown and his men. Uh, they before this this went on, they were talking about sort of establishing a, a free state of Kansas or a free state of Topeka, and they mm. worked on uh, this is when it was still a territory, and they worked on what it would be if it was like made in their their image the way they wanted it to be the way it should be, and so they even designed a state motto, a state logo, and listen to this. So I don't know who actually drew it. The author didn't say, but this is a product of Brown's men uh, that they came up with. Listen to the state. Look, look at the illustration that the state model was going to be. It was a black man firing a cannon. <laughs> <laughs> that was the state model. <laughs> Imagine if there was really a state in the United States of America that was a black man firing a cannon. Firing a cannon. Right, right. <laughs> like that was, <laughs> that time, I mean, or any time, really. That's, that's hilarious, Joe. Like even it's like like the you know the Black Panthers, it's just a fist in the air. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> firing a cannon. Yeah. Imagine, imagine the Black Panthers having a, like a, a flag with a dude just holding a, a, a gat or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> you know. But he did this all I mean, over. So check this out. This is interesting. Uh, so when people would come over his house who were white, who weren't necessarily on the same page as him, they did not understand. They were not used to eating with black folks. And so hmm. uh, one of the visitors later recollects it. Quote, at mealtime, Dana and his companions, Brown's black friends, and the family were seated at a long table, but did not eat until the head of the household prayed over the food. As they dined, Dana noticed the natural manner Brown showed to his black guest and was even a bit put off by the way he addressed the blacks, quote, using their surnames such as Mr. Jefferson. Dana assumed these guests had, quote, not been so treated or spoken to often before, and that, quote, they had all the awkwardness of field hands on a plantation, and what to do on the introduction was quite beyond their experience, end quote. Now, that may not necessarily be true. That may be just be uh, the person writing that their sort of racist recollection, because John Brown did that with everybody, and uh, he, he, and he went out his way to have everyone be part of the conversation, it said, and this is the way he functioned with his community in Upper Elba, and you can see it by the letters he wrote and, and all those kinds of things, so it's uh, you know, th that's their interpretation of it, but that doesn't mean it. And listen to this. This relates to the it kind of reminds me of um, uh, the Apostle Paul, like when Peter was, was ushering the Gentile believers mm -hmm. out the back door, right? And Paul was, them, you know, because it's, you say you're being out of step with the gospel, it's kind of like John Brown is like, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna be like Peter in this instance, and I'm gonna, you know, be impartial. Mm -hmm. It was like a rat, it's like a really radical impartialism, you know, for that time. It's, it's pretty powerful, yeah. And you can even see that, you know, I sent you that quote. And um, <clears throat> so there's a, a racist uh, minister who, during the Kansas-Missouri Wars, his name is Martin White, ended up killing one of John Brown's sons. And later mm. on, uh, they came across his property when the, the men were there. And uh, they were like, hey, these men said to John Brown, there's Martin White, and they knew he killed his son. Let us go down and oh. talk to him. And John Brown said, no, only if you won't harm a hair in his head. This is not about personal vengeance. This is about justice. He went and let him kill the guy who killed his son. That's and they deep. said, and they said, we only want to go down if you get let us go without instruction. <laughs> Meaning we can go kill him. <laughs> and he said, then, then I forbid you to go. And they respected him enough they didn't go down there. But that's how uh, he was. But prior to that, they were in a meeting together at uh 
<clears throat> Dutch Henry's crossing, and at this, they were having a debate about paying taxes because Brown said, we're not going to pay taxes to the government because it supports slavery. So we're having this debate, mm. and he responded, listen to this quote, quote, I'm an abolitionist of the old stock, was dyed in the wool. Oh, well, this is so. This is Martin White's recollection of what John Brown said. So this is White saying what Brown said. Uh, Abolitionist mm-hmm. of the old stock was dyed in the wool and that Negroes were his brothers and equals. That he would rather see this union dissolved and the country drenched in blood than to pay taxes to the amount of the 100th part of a mill. So they're saying, I, I don't pay any tax. I'd rather have the union dissolved if you're going to support slavery. But this mm-hmm. Martin White was shocked. This guy would get up and say, they're my brothers and equals. They just they can't understand someone who thinks like that. Couldn't comprehend it. Yeah, that's wild, man. I mean, the, the fact that, that he recalls that aspect of it, you know, um, alongside, you know, wanting to see the country drenched dr- dr- in blood, apparently. But, I mean, yeah, it, again, that's the, a kind of radical impartialism. You know, the, the mm-hmm. notion of, you know, an African person as your brother, an equal. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we talked about about uh, Abraham Lincoln earlier. I mean, that certainly, at least early on, wasn't his uh, account. Right. I mean, he believed that slavery was going too far, but um, he didn't, you know, take it to steps where he thought that Africans were right. equals. I mean, so you know, John John Brown was in pretty uh, exclusive um, territory right there, man. I mean, I can imagine there weren't a lot of people no. uh, riding with like that, you know. Now they were put off by it, and they. Um... They it's they didn't understand it, you know, and, they, and the thing is, John Brown liked to troll people, and so there's mm. a couple stories of him trolling people that I think are just epic, and one of them is when they had captured some white folks, uh, and they 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 captured these white folks. John Brown would purposely have the the black soldiers guard them, <laughs> and uh, the, 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 there was a time where you know uh, they had to walk. Because he said, look, we can't let you be on these horses going through this trek because we don't trust you. You'll go, you'll go away. But John Brown said, if you have to walk. We're going to make you walk, the, the prisoners. But I'll walk with you. So he, he didn't ride a horse. He walked with these prisoners because he wanted to say, like, I'll – like, I just – he's such a unique guy. And one of the guys wrote, wild, about it, yeah. wrote about it later, one of these, you know, guys who was clearly a racist – but said, I must admit, I had never been treated kinder. I never met a finer Christian. I never knew anyone who knew the scriptures so well. Although I was a little off put, pop, off put by having to eat with the N words and having them guard me with guns. But John Brown <laughs> right. did that on purpose. Right. So you know, right, right. like he would do that kind right. of stuff on purpose. Like here, you guard him. <laughs> like, but you know he, what, man? I mean, I'm thinking about it too. I don't. It's just something you said. I can't remember what it was, but I mean, I feel like there's something we can learn from John Brown in terms of just being so countercultural. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like, it is very rare to see somebody that, that is, I mean, the idea of going against white supremacy at that time to the extent that he was willing to go, like, I mean, just extremely countercultural. I mean, what if we were like that today, man? I mean, right. think about that. I mean, like, I, I'm going to just be real. I, I, I mentioned this on my show, like, not so long ago, but like right now, I mean, there's literally like an illegal sex trade going on all around us. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a real thing. You know, like how often, you know, does that break my heart? And and shouldn't it? You know what I mean? Like there are things that are going around us all the time that we should be as Adam. Now, now let me let me clarify. I'm saying we're saying this. I'm not encouraging people to go start killing folks and, and like violently, you know, rising up against criminals or, or for whatever cause. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that in terms of being countercultural, like decidedly countercultural and against the evils that are going on around us, there's something to be said about that, man. It's something to be said about that. I agree. And uh, this is the last thing I'm going to read from the book. We're asking what the book is. Uh, A Religious Life of John Brown is a subtitle. The book's called Fire from the Midst of You, New York University Press, Louis DeCaro. And the other book I recommend is David S. Reynolds' book on John Brown. Let me read this here from page 107 of the book. Because this is more about what we're talking about. And then maybe we'll talk a little about Harvest Ferry and then play one more trailer and call it a night. But great conversation. People were uh, enjoying this. Check this out. After the Browns affiliated themselves with the Congregational Church in Franklin Mills, the church cooperated in a widely advertised revival series. John Jr. and Ruth, these are his children, remembered their family attending the evangelistic meetings featuring a guest preacher from Cleveland. At the first service, the Browns sat in their family pew. So this is the church they already went to, but this is during like a time where they're having a guest speaker during a revival service, which was rented according to the custom of the day. During the service, Brown noticed that black people, some of whom he knew, had been seated at the very back of the church near the door. At the next meeting, he noticed that the same discrimination had taken place. Indignant, 
he stood up and announced to the church that an inequity had been committed in the seating of the colored portion of the audience. (laughs) Ruth, who was nearly 10 years old when this occurred, always remembered the facial expressions in the church. Quote, the whole congregation was shocked. (laughs) You think? (laughs) But I remember my father's firm, determined look. Brown then invited the blacks to switch seats. They taking the Brown family pew, and the Browns taking their seats in the back by the door. Because wow. it was their church, wow. their seat. I guess wow. they rented it. The, the, the next day, two deacons came to the house to scold him for his actions, but he would have none of it. For the rest of the revival series, black people sat in the Brown pew, and the Browns sat around the wood stove near the door. Wow. Wow. That's, That's deep. Good. That's deep. I mean, but I mean, that's biblical, though, right? I mean, I think about like the book of James, right? And I'm, I'm going to misquote it, but it talks about like when mm-hmm. a rich man comes in miss, don't like, you know, pull out the stool from him in the front mm-hmm. or whatever. Like, I mean, that's that's what that's talking about. And so he's putting in the practice of scriptures, which goes back to your point earlier about like understanding the, the, the Christian underpinnings mm-hmm. of a guy like John Brown. I mean, hey, he, he was really, he was going hard in the paint for the scriptures, dog. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> because of the portrayal of him as a psycho, he is not really seen as the American hero that he should be. I think yeah. if we can recognize now, this is might be controversial, but this is my perspective. If we can recognize the virtues of George Washington while recognizing his flaws when he died, he had 300 slaves. But if we can recognize his virtues uh, and and have them have him some way understand the heroic aspects of certain things of what he did, for example, how much more a guy like John Brown? There, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, you know, not that it's all about idolizing people and all that, but I think there should be. If you're gonna have statues of anybody, you know, take these Confederate statues down, put some John Brown statues up. I think Brown. there should be more statues <laughs> oh, of him. Oh man, like you know, people's heads would explode, yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <seriously. laughs> John Brown. I Yo, think, the daughters of the Confederacy would just wild out. I mean, I mean, but I mean, to your point though, and and you and I talked about this, right? I mean, that, and I'm not exactly sure how it happens, but there is like these different categories. Of, of like historical characters that we just kind of uh, put people in. So like for example, you got the the A listers, if you will, like the you know, the Thomas Jeffersons, the George right. Washingtons, that just uh-huh. considered to be top notch good guys. And then you have the obvious bad guys. Like when you hear Benedict Arnold, like you know, okay, that's a bad guy. John you know, Wilkes Booth, obviously a bad guy. John Wilkes Booth, the bad guy. And then you got like this weird other category where you have like these guys who are kind of like blackballed and just kind of understood to be bad, but it's like a vague bad. You know what I mean? Like and those guys, like Marcus Garvey, mm-hmm. uh, you know John Brown. I would put I would put Nat Turner in that category because I think most people don't really you know know much about Nat Turner. They just know that he killed a bunch of white people. That's all they they know, mm-hmm. but they don't really understand like you know the, the context and things like that. So it's not like people go out of their way to talk about you know why these guys are blacklisted. But there is like this weird other category. And I feel like in our education system, we need to be aware of things like that. We need to just teach history as it is and, you know, glean from what we can and, and yep. keep it moving. And um, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, we shouldn't esteem people beyond what is due. But if you have a guy who's like literally put his life on the line for biblical morality and the Constitution, quite frankly, I mean, he, like you said, he upheld the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as being positive documents. He said you know, two, driving, two driving forces. Yeah was the golden rule and the declaration or i'm sorry the constitution of the united states those two things he upheld and said those are the two driving things you know what i mean and so uh he uh he really was radical but that's just because america was so backwards and uh and 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 see he's he's not talked about in the way he should be in fact the author said when he was going to write this book someone in his church said yeah but didn't he kill people you know, and that was kind well, of all. I mean, okay. <laughs> and, uh, there's a famous movie with Ronald Reagan, actually, 1940, called the Santa Fe Trail. And hmm. in that movie, uh, John Brown makes a cameo and he's like a psycho. And Malcolm X comments about John Brown. He's like, you know, this is a paraphrase of Malcolm X, but you, I can show you the quote. I actually have it because mm-hmm. Louis DeCaro also, also is a scholar of Malcolm X. But X said, you know, I don't really trust these white liberals. And if you really want to know what they think, I would say ask them what they think about John Brown because John Brown has been trained by white folks as a crazy man because who in their right mind would die for black folks like basically, but uh, he wasn't ask these white liberals what they think about John Brown. That'll tell you a lot about the actual politics. So he used it as mm. a sort of a, uh, all a limit test is yeah. what he would say. And he said, yeah. I just watched a movie the other day cause it came out in 1940 and it was about like six years before uh, Malcolm X 
uh, well, he didn't say the other day, but went went I guess to 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 to, uh, to jail or prison or whatever. He said, uh, mm-hmm. "I saw a movie with John Brown, and if he was the way white folks portray him, I wouldn't want to be around him." But that wasn't really how John Brown was. And this is after he was uh, out of prison, so he had clearly read about John Brown and knew. Right, uh, right, right. Be, so that's a fascinating thing, you know what I mean? And why why isn't he you know lauded and all that? Because what happens is. He basically what even though he failed in Harper's Ferry, and what's interesting is why he failed. He failed because he lingered too long. They should have left that day. He stayed the night mm. there and waited until the next day. Why? Because to him it was essential to have the freed slaves come join him. To him, wow. if they didn't come, the whole plan wouldn't work. They didn't come. Nobody really came. Yeah. He had a certain yeah. expectation that was not realized. So he waited. And the other thing was he was trying to actually procure, procure fair treatment for the prisoners that he had. Right. Those two things right. made him dilly-dally until he was cut off. And guess who came to 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 fight him and have him surrender was Robert E. Lee. That was the general. So it's yeah. very ironic, right? But Bobby Lee. He could yeah. have escaped because they controlled both bridges in, Harper's Fer- in the town called Harper's Ferry. They controlled mm-hmm. both bridges that whole day. But he waited. Because he waited for the yeah. folks to come, they didn't come. He should have left, and they could have just, right, right. you know. But so that's that's really what happened. But well, and and oh, I'm sorry. No, go no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I mean, I was thinking about too. I think maybe, and we talked about this before too. Like maybe he just kind of um, didn't quite assess or didn't didn't accurately assess the mentality of the enslaved person. You know, I mean, it's kind of hard to really put yourself in that space. That's it, but bro. It's, that's it. Yeah, yeah. He he. So check this out. This is a little controversial. I debated if I was going to talk about this. John Brown followed a more radical uh, liberationist um, uh, abolitionist newspaper. I forgot the name of it. But uh, it was more radical than Douglas's. And uh, the guy who published mm. it, a uh, black publisher, was like all about John Brown. They were like two of two. They were like on the same uh, page in a lot of ways, right? Mm-hmm. And mm. John Brown, people don't realize how accepted he was in the black community in his day. The people that knew him. Now, the pro- part of the problem is a lot of these enslaved yeah, it's persons. It's kind of like, uh, what? You know, like every hood has like a white mic. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He's, you know, John Brown was white mic back in the day. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, seriously. Even during his Paul day. Wall. But see, he, uh, but the problem is not not enough people knew about him, right? And yeah. so uh, the the name of this, this liberationist, abolitionist paper published um, was called The Ram's Horn. And on the mm-hmm. masthead, it declared, We are men. And therefore interested in whatever concerns men. And so this is what Brown was down with. He had a close relationship with the editor who was named Hodges. And both Brown and Hodges were against what they considered speechifying. And part of their main, guess who their main critics were? were or the main people they criticized, both Brown and Hodges, was Northerners who said they were abolitionists or for freedom but didn't do anything. And Northern black folks. They were, they were wow. critical of their spending habits, of the way... Of the, because they felt like they basically weren't really down. And so John right. Brown submitted an article to this paper called The Ram's Horn, an essay. Guess what it's called? And he, he was accept, this was accepted and it's published. It's called Sambo's mm. Mistakes. Dang. Now, listen to this, bro. I, I, this, you got to understand, the guy said yes, and they published it. He wrote it as a black person who had learned and then was now telling advice. Check this out. Interesting. Written Interesting. in the voice of an experienced black man, Sambo's Mistakes was John Brown's way of expressing his constructive criticism of the free black community. By presenting these criticisms as confessions, Sambo speaks of reading, quote, silly novels and other miserable trash, quote, instead of cultivating a taste for, quote, sober truth, useful knowledge, or practical wisdom, end quote. Trying to emulate whites, he also spent a lot of money on tobacco products instead of good books and joined, quote, secret societies rather than seeking the company of wise and spiritually minded people. Sambo had also been waylaid by trivial issues of human pride instead of taking, quote, measures calculated to promote the general welfare of black people. He was likewise guilty of opposing a brother's attempt to succeed instead being determined to, quote, injure his influence, oppose his measures, and even glory in his defeats while his intentions were good and his plans well laid. You know, the crab, mm. the crabs in a, a barrel type of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. In attire and leisure, Sambo never denied himself of decorations and pleasures like gay clothing, jewelry, watches, expensive parties, and other fashionable amusements. Now he had come to realize that he might have spent his money for his suffering brethren instead. He also mm. confessed to political weakness. 
This is the key. I'm going to read this. This is a quote from Sambo's Mistakes, written by John Brown, published by a radical black abolitionist newspaper. Quote, (laughs) I have always expected to secure the favor of the whites by tamely submitting to every species of indignity, contempt, and wrong. Instead of nobly resisting their brutal aggressions from principle and taking my place as a man and assuming the responsibilities of a man, a citizen, a husband, a father, a brother, a neighbor, a friend, as God required of everyone. Dang. (laughs) So what he's saying is he's saying Sambo realized don't turn the other cheek (laughs) in in this context. And right, so right, the, right. So he really wrote that and really said that. I, I thought that was you know so, something he said interesting too. And this is not necessarily. Um, I mean, I see where you were going there, but he said he said something about secret societies uh, about them. You know, I guess folks in the north. Now, I find that interesting because now I may be. I think he means uh, masons. I think he's well. Yeah, it could masons. be. And, and, yeah, possibly. I'm, I'm wondering too. There's a guy named um, William Cooper Nell, and I, I've quoted him on my show before. He wrote this book called Black Patriots in 1852. Oh yeah, and uh, one, one right. thing I. Yeah, one thing I find interesting is with him is that he's described as being, um, I'm, I'm probably going to use the wrong word, but it's kind of like a spiritualist, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it, he, I guess he had gotten in, um, involved in some movement where it's kind of like, you know, seances and, you know, they would get together and, you know, kind of stuff like that. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that, uh, that get, that trend, I wonder if that's what John Brown was alluding to there. You know, because like, he, he said something about these secret societies as opposed to, I think he said something about spiritual wisdom or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but from, surrounding yourself by older, wiser people and reading books. Yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting. Good. You know, kind and of the, like basically, you know, getting away from the groundedness of and wisdom of, of scripture and whatnot, and getting into this other foolishness. I wonder if that's what he was alluding to. Sambo's mistakes, bro. John Brown really. Sambo's mistakes. Yeah, you gotta really be down in the black <laughs> community to to be a white man and call somebody a Sambo. <laughs> I mean, that's. You gotta be, really be in. You gotta really be in, dog. Well, notice he's saying the person that. previously said, "I'll get white folks' favor by suffering all these indignities," but yeah, now because yeah, yeah. it's he's confessing his errors, he's saying, "Now I realize I need to take my place as a man and fight right. back." That's what he's he's, right. he's calling That's for deep. violent resistance. That's what he, you know. And, and it kind of reminds me of Henry Harlan Garnett because Henry Harlan Garnett was mm-hmm. another guy that that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Frederick Douglass kind of had uh, not beef, but you know they saw things differently. Mm-hmm. In that Henry Harding Garnett was like, "Yo, we need to go fight." And there's actually another group um, called uh, the Knights of Tabor. We don't have as much evidence about them um, as I would like, but there's a guy named Moses Dixon who speaks of uh, the group called the Knights of Tabor. And I want to say maybe between two to five years, maybe before the Civil War pops off, you know they're they're planning and claim to have had thousands of black people ready to go down to the South and fight. But then the Civil War pops off, and so they fell back. John Brown um, so, started you know, something like that too, called the Gileadites. Like before oh, okay. he did so what he did, go. he started a, like an armed black resistance that was called the Gileadites. Same idea. See, that's what I'm saying. So <laughs> I mean, it, it's weird because like, so there was these different movements all at the same time. But like Brown was the only one that like really seemed like he, he was like ready to follow through and just just go in like that. You know what I mean? And so it's funny you just mentioned Garnett because this story about Garnett is amazing. Check this out. Mm. Douglas, speaking of Frederick Douglas, Douglas visited the Browns at Akron too, probably during his trip to Ohio. Another abolitionist visitor was Henry Highland Garnett, the fiery sure. clergyman and underground railroad veteran. <clears throat> Salmon Brown, that's one of John Brown's kids, remember being a teenager when Garnett made a visit during the winter. Mm. Salmon was sympathetic to Garnett in his in, in, in his and in his enthusiasm. He unintentionally overheated the stove in the room where the black preacher was staying. So John Brown had taught his kids to like idolize these guys. So he was like all excited. So he wanted to make yeah. his room warm that night. He but he overheated it. So listen to this story. Oh, well. This this is a crazy story, bro. Watch this. Rather yeah. than being comfortably warmed, Garnett spent a miserable, sleepless night sweating profusely before <laughs> Salmon's monstrous fire. To punish him for his carelessness. John Brown made his son carry Garnett's bags all the way to the train station, quote, past staring neighbors and grinning school children. <laughs> he made his white kids carry Garnett's bags and punish him for turning the heat too much, bro. That is hilarious. <laughs> That's wild, bro. That's wild. That is just like. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I would love to have, you know, uh, know more about the conversations they had, man, because I can mm-hmm. imagine they, them cats was probably, they, I mean, because Garnett was about that life too, dog. Yeah. He wasn't playing, man. He wasn't playing, you know. And I mean, obviously, you do see guys, you know, once the Civil War pops off, you do see guys like Martin Delaney, for example. And um, I want to mm-hmm. say like, uh, I think J.W. Le Guin, 
getting in on the act as far as, um, you know, actually fighting in the Civil War. So when the chips were down, you know, cats came through, you know, but it's just I think these guys were ahead of the game, man. No, no doubt. RNO said he shouted out Acker, Akron. RNO, are you from Akron or is Basic from Akron? Because he's a Basic. Are you guys both from Akron? Who's from Akron? I'm curious because you know I'm from Columbus. Speaking of Columbus, I see a warrior woman talking about my hat. I bought this in Columbus. Um, I went to a uh, uh, underground hip hop show no, last time I visited. Well, everyone says it's Wally, but what it is is he's the lookout guy. If he's got big giant eyes like binoculars and two spray paint cans. Oh, oh, so he, okay. So I bought this from graffiti artists who made their own lighting, line of clothing in Columbus when I was at this underground hip hop show. He's oh, cool. looking out for the cops. So he got okay, gotcha, gotcha. So, and he's got his shoes ready. To I thought run. it was. I thought it was Wally. Okay. No, gotcha. no, he's yeah. looking out for the cops, ready to tell. Right, right. When I used to graph, we always had. Well, if we were doing it smart that day, a lot of times we didn't. We were idiots. But uh, uh, what I did is uh, we always had one guy who was a lookout guy, and a right, lookout right, right. guy. I mean, we just had him say five zero, you know, when they would see cops. And so as soon as they saw cops, it was five zero, and then we would go. But, but uh, uh anyway, okay, Malone's dark past. <laughs> yeah, well, anyways, yeah. So, so guys, it's it's not Wally. It's not Wally. Wally. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lookout guy. Right, right, right. But uh, oh, hold on, let me fix this. All right, so yeah, so so here's the thing though, and we do got to wind this up. It's been an amazing conversation. Oh, it's bad. The yeah. raid on cool. Harper's Ferry was successful in the sense of what it did is it caused the South to be fearful because they started associating the North with John Brown. Nothing can mm. be further from the truth, though. John mm. Brown was not representative of the North, but they stereotyped really? the North as they stereotyped John Brown as being typical of Northern aggression. You see what I'm saying? So it gave them greater fear for the North. So what mm -hmm. happens is, um, and it's kind of complex, it basically related the South's fears and then who the Republicans had to nominate as a candidate was directly because of John Brown's activities. So they mm -hmm. put up Lincoln. Lincoln never would have won the Republican primary because the Republican Party was split, mainly because of Brown's actions, because this was a massive resonating thing throughout the culture and society. Oh, um, yeah. And so what happens is, uh, it basically led to the election of Lincoln, and it eventually, essentially, was what was like this the spark of the Civil War ultimately, because the the South became paranoid, and that's mm -hmm. what led to all this. So it's a fascinating thing. And John Brown's prediction was true. He said the only way this is going to get done is through much bloodshed. And he 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 quoted. He would often say, basically, I'm willing to lose a generation of Americans to get rid of this. He would say, I'm willing to lose a generation. That's, kind of and that's exactly what it took. So he was that's right. Deep. And, you know, Lincoln thought we could just preserve the Union, you know, da-da. By the end, Lincoln realized, okay, yeah, that's what it's going to be. That it was, So it took a while. John Brown was sort of prophetic yeah. in that understanding and role. And here's what's so crazy. Here's what's so crazy. John Brown chastised a lot of times people who were speechified. And just talked a lot. Although he was actually mm -hmm. an amazing orator. People don't actually know his talks were amazing. He inspired people to come join him. He was an amazing orator because he was an intelligent, persuasive man. Yes. People don't know, know that about it. They think he was just like a gorilla guy. But but that that wasn't all he was. He was very convincing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he – he what, what, what happens is even though he was against that and he was about action, right? Go – you better do the thing. It wasn't his action in a sense that – um is what changed everything it was his words because he was not killed when they captured him at harper's ferry he should have been this is mm -hmm. providential one of the main guys had two swords and he grabbed his ceremonial sword that day when he went out to the battle he was in a hurry because they were hurrying up to call him to stop john brown he didn't grab the right sword, his actual military sword. He grabbed the ceremonial sword, not designed for combat, only designed for ceremonies, military ceremonies. But he didn't realize it until it was too late. So he goes in, and he's one of the first people who was able to get a hack at John Brown. He has a sword. He takes a hack directly at his head. He is aiming to kill John Brown immediately. John Brown moves. It leaves a gash in his neck. He gets him a couple times in the head. And then he goes directly into his chest, and the sword doubles up. It bends in half, and he realizes, yeah. this is my ceremonial sword because it wasn't strong enough to do that. And so John Brown was injured but not dead, and it was about a month before he was sentenced and, and hung. In that mm. month, he wrote a bunch of letters that were reprinted all over, 
and spoke to people, and that is what made him so famous. If he would have died wow. there, it would just been another thing. But it was behavior during his incarceration and even during the final uh, trial times. That is what got everyone's attention. So the funny thing wow. about him is ultimately the main thing that was such a big boom was his words, actually, at the end of the day. Now, his actions put him in the place yeah. for that. But that, that it's, it's a very fascinating thing. And David Reynolds does a great job of bringing this out. He shows all the things that Brown wrote and said. And DeCaro has a book just about his letters from the jail there in, uh, I think it's called Charlestown or Charleston. Charlestown. Mm. Charlestown mm -hmm. has a book just on the letters that he wrote and their impact and all that. So it really steeled up uh, Americans who were somewhat sympathetic, the abolitionists, all kinds of people. And it was just a fascinating thing. Although a lot of people were associated with John Brown when this happened, a lot of them fled the country. They were they were afraid, including Douglas. Douglas oh, went of to, course, yeah, yeah. Douglas went to Canada and then went to the UK. He <laughs> came back. Said, yeah, yeah, just slide out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but a, and one guy yeah. went crazy because they were all afraid to death because of... And then one guy, though, was one of the few guys not killed immediately there, Shields Green. Shields and I'm going to end the show yeah, by yeah. playing the trailer. You're the one who told me about the movie. Now, you don't remember much about it, but right. can you mention a little bit about it before we play this trailer and call I, it a day? I, I can't. I can't, but I do want to say something real quick about about um, about those letters, though, because I think it's interesting that if if John Brown had gone out as he's typically depicted as just kind of a crazy guy, mm -hmm. then you know he would be easy to dismiss, mm -hmm. you know. But like you said, I do think it was providence in that you know when you're reading his words and you're like, wait, no, this dude is super rational. This guy mm -hmm. is very sane. You can't just you know you know push him off to the side. You have to take him seriously, you know. And and when you think about it. It makes so much sense. I mean, granted, I mean, obviously he did you know, lose his life, but given that opportunity before he does, I mean, of course, that would be a, a, a catalyst for, you know, the, the events to follow, because now, you, you know, you have to take this voice seriously. What would drive this man who is so sane to take such uh, such steps? And in a way, and I know we want to get to this clip, but I want to say something about Nat Turner, too, because there's these parallels mm -hmm. when you think about Southern fear. Oh, yeah. You know, it was it was very palpable. Oh, yeah. You know, even before the Civil War, I mean, because when you have uh, like the, the the reaction to the Nat Turner situation was like this overcorrection, like you know, yeah, total cast overkill. Was just wild, mm -hmm. super overkill. Because there's this fear, it's like you know, there's you know, there's this possibility. I mean, you got millions of Africans out here. I mean, obviously, there's this possibility that things can go really wrong, and your life can be over. You know, whether it be materially or otherwise. I mean, that's that was a real fear, right? But then when you see something like a Nat Turner or a John Brown made that a reality and it's like oh snap like we, we got to do something and so it makes sense why you know again like with john brown in the same way that they have this overreaction with nat turner same thing with john brown it's like you know it's not just a one-off situation it, from their perception you know john brown's not a one-off situation it's like oh no they, the world is you know the sky is falling whatever you know what i mean you know, feel feasy you know, adam Cohen for president 2024 you know but um but yeah so shields green man so i you know it's funny i was sitting back at the crib you know, me and my wife were just looking for some movies or whatever, and I just stumbled across this movie about this guy, Shields Green. I didn't know anything about him, you know, um, but, you know, he was a guy who was an escaped enslaved person, uh, was kind of known for being uh, intellectual. You just seen it. He, is, everybody who encountered him felt like there was the, something different ran, about him. even ran the plantation, not as like a sellout, but someone who kept track of everything he was like the yeah like part of his narrative yeah. now actually i've, I've got to go back and you know i don't know if there's some artistic license here or not but at least in the movie um there's this one portion where the the plantation was on i mean he was a, put it this way he's kind of like joseph in a way you know and in, in, in uh where joseph goes into egypt and it's kind of like running things like that you know what i mean that, that's kind of how um uh, this guy shields green was uh for you know for yeah, his initial that's a good, slave master you know that's a good comparison in the movie so right. i read a little bit about it uh Shields Green, uh, there's some artistic license taken in the movie, but the basic sure. essence of a lot of it, is my understanding, is true. And it came out actually in 2020. It's called Emperor. So yeah, a Emperor, lot of people yeah. haven't seen mm -hmm. it because, you know, right now people don't know about movies getting released and all that. It I thought dope, yeah. the critics were too hard on the movie. I was glad you told me about it. I thought it was great. Watching this and also with a uh, good Lord, Lord Bird on Showtime, which is people were asking, that was a series. It was a miniseries. It just came out last month. Yeah. Watching mm -hmm. that and then Shields Green called the Emperor the movie. Those were good because they had a John Brown portrayal. The John Brown there, I think, was probably more accurate. He was an austere, serious man who was very uh, logical and convincing. 
I can't and, remember the uh, actor, but he did a good job with it. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. he he was he was, but it wasn't as funny or interesting in a sense because of, <laughs> right, you know right, the right. Ethan Hawke character is funny, but I can see why a historian right. might not, not might not be happy about some of it. Um, but uh, so I was thinking of when we close, I'll just play the trailer for Emperor because these are two things right, that came cool, out yeah. this year about John Brown. And you know, for a while, the last yeah. thing we had was the Ronald Reagan 1940 movie, which just portrayed him as a psycho. And uh, mm-hmm. so there is stuff there. There's even a kid's book written by a Christian author. I've been finding all kinds of resources. And so we might return to this because this is important, I think, as it relates to apologetics. Because you see, we're not just talking about John Brown. We're talking about John Brown in context, and that's important to discuss. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and you know, I say it all the time. I'm sure I've said it on your show before. But, I mean, as I've studied, you know, black history, American mm-hmm. history or whatever, I mean, you, you do see how just so much of the Christian narrative has been just drained out oh, yeah, oh, yeah. of these various figures. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. just totally. And so I think just really uh, from, from, from my standpoint as apologist, I mean, to be quite frank, I mean, um, whereas when I was kind of growing up listening to like, you know, x Clan and Karis one and, and you mm-hmm. know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you, it's this notion that you have to reach back to Africa mm-hmm. in order to have something to be proud of, you know. Right. But what I've come to see is that actually as, as a black Christian, particularly, you know, there's actually people right here in American soil, you know, our, our direct ancestors who we can be proud of as well. And, and I mean, just even beyond the ones that we're typically taught of. I mean, there's so many people. We could talk about Otto Cato. We could talk about so many different guys. And um, I, th- I just think it's, it's pretty cool to see movies like this come out. I, mean, I would encourage you to see that Bass Reeves movie, too. That's, that's that? another joint that? that was pretty good. Uh, Bass Reeves, man. He was he was a, a black cowboy. And, I mean, dude was called? a beast, bro. What's it, what's it called? Oh, man. I, you know, see, I, it's, I'm messing this, up. I got to look it up. Out, but, um, come out uh, this year or what? I believe so. Matter of fact, while you're playing the clip, I could probably find it. But, um... We'll drop yeah, it in the live Reeves. chat because I was going to make the outro clip. They actually say that that the Lone Ranger was it, it, the movie. The Lone Ranger was based on Bass Reeves, who was a black mm. cowboy. Mm. Yep, I've heard about some uh, pretty dope uh, black cow- cowboys, maybe, but I don't know all the things. I'd like to I'd like to see. Them. Oh yeah, Deadwood Dick. You know, okay, it's called um, yeah, Hell on the Border: The Real Life Exploits of U.S. Deputy. Um, Bass, uh, Deputy Marshal Bass Reeves. Yeah, hell on Apparently, the board. everyone else knows about it but me. Uh, Tyler Lott says the original Lone Ranger. Alicia Henderson says Bass Reeves was there the first go. black sheriff in the Old West. So okay. He was a beast. He was a beast. Now you start. We got some Bass Reeves fan out here. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. Adam Coleman has been great. And uh, thank you guys for coming along tomorrow. I'm going to talk to Abu. We're going to have a follow up conversation about DNA and Hebrewism. And mm. then uh, then you guys have a happy Thanksgiving on Thursday. And uh, Friday, I'll drop a video. And then Saturday, I don't know yet. And then Sunday, I'm going to talk to Phil Fox about the Seminole Hebrew Israelite claims in regard to One West. But tell people one more time how to find you, and then I'm going to play this clip. Yeah, no doubt, man. Yeah, check me out on, uh, you know, right here on YouTube, uh, True ID Apologetics. That's T-R-U ID Apologetics, True ID uh, podcast.com, true ID apologetics.com, and my gaming channel. Check me out at True ID Gaming. I just started doing that, man. We have some game nights where basically we just kick it, yeah, you know, play some video games, and we just kind of hang out and, and talk about apologetics. It's kind of more like relaxed version of the stuff that I do on my channel, uh, typically. So that's another game, cha- that's a separate YouTube channel, uh, for True ID Gaming. And I'm also on Twitch, uh, as True ID 7, T R U I D, uh, and the number seven. So yeah, man. Check us out. True ID Gaming. <laughs> right. All right, man. Well, let's play this clip. And uh, sorry, Misty Richards, I can't do freestyle tonight because we've already went too long. And again, shout out to Jonathan Green. Thank you for your contribution. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight. And uh, I believe it was... Uh, You're going to uh, deprive your viewers of a freestyle, bro? You're going to really do that? How, man? Come on, bro. Just, this uh, house way. Uh, first of all, they owe me. <laughs> I've given them bonus freestyles. Where where, where they owe oh, me. Oh, snap. <laughs> chat second, ties in the chat okay yeah yeah man. Uh, <laughs> shout out to sam miguel i see you bro uh, next time but all right let's play this clip and i'm gonna call it a night man hey thanks to god god, god bless bro all right yeah, all right make apologetics fun again peace We're there. oh let me get the volume on this uh let me get the volume on this you do this if you're dead i'm already dead I've taken lashes my whole life to keep my family safe, (laughs) but they will never whip my son again. You do this and you're dead.
I'm already dead. You gotta go. That man escaped your plantation and single-handedly killed three of men. I ain't trying to break you down. Well, you might as well give up now. He's smart. They say he's African royalty. They call him Emperor. If you can't take the heat, don't light the fuse. You know why they call me Emperor? Because my granddaddy was a king. In me, I trust, yeah. Say you killed a bunch of white folk. Came here ready to fight on this night. What you bring him here for? Ain't you got no manners? The longer he keeps it up, you got yourselves a rebellion. I need you to be the spark that lights the fuse. Yeah. You better just run for your life. Well, I guess I'm in trouble then. He's a brave man. It's too risky. You're going to get yourself killed? It's the only way I can free my son. The word, Mom! You got to get out of here. You're not just your slave anymore. You're a symbol. You ever consider going the outlaw business? Boy, I got the whole South chasing me. I'm already an outlaw. Run 